Uh, buenas tardes, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Menchaca. I am the chairman of the New York, City's, New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. Uh, I want to start by saying that some of you might be here uh, for this hearing with immigration, health, and general welfare, but if you're here for the correctional health hearing, uh, Chair Powers of the criminal justice, and, uh, and this is a joint committee with health and hospitals, that hearing is now on the 14th floor of, of City Council, 250 Broadway, and you can make your way over there. I would like to thank the Speaker of the City Council uh, for his commitment to this issue. He'll be joining us a little later today. I also want to thank our chairs of general welfare and health committees, council members Steve Levin and Mark Levine for their partnership and for their commitment to protecting the health and well-being of our city's immigrant residents and families. I would also like to recognize the members of the Immigration Committee who have joined us. We have Councilmember Holden here uh, and Barry Krudenchuk as well uh, from Queens. Councilmember from Queens is here as well. Today the Committee on Immigration along with the Committees of General Welfare and Health will examine the Trump administration's newly proposed rule to dramatically expand the standard of public charge. This is not just dramatic, it's draconian. This includes a list of public benefits that the federal government would treat as negative factors in visa and green card applications. Along or among the public benefits included in the expanded rule that is proposed are SNAP, housing assistance, Medicaid, and Medicare Part D. We will hear from the members of the public, the advocates, as well as the administration, who will be able to speak on how this proposal will impact New York City and its residents. In addition to holding this joint oversight hearing, the Committee on Immigration is hearing two resolutions today. Reso 608, sponsored by the Speaker, authorizing the Speaker to submit a public comment on behalf of the Council to the Federal Register concerning the proposed change to the public charge rule. And Resolution 609, sponsored by the Speaker, opposing the newly proposed public charge rule and urging the Federal Government not to move forward with its adoption. As Council members of the City, it is our responsibility to protect the rights and welfare of all our residents, including the 3.1 million immigrants who call this city home. Our immigrant community is an essential part of the city's fabric, our history, and the vibrancy that we each enjoy every single day. New York City would not be what it is without them, without our immigrant heritage. At its core, this proposed rule is an assault on immigrant communities, including our city's own immigrant community, and part of the federal government's patchwork of anti-immigrant policies. It, is effectively, it effectively penalizes immigrants and immigrant families when they are poor, forcing immigrants to choose between their well-being and being able to stay in this country lawfully. By targeting benefits that help families with food, housing, and health care, this proposed rule will deeply harm our communities. According to the preliminary estimate by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, who we'll hear from today, an estimated 475,000 New Yorkers could be harmed by this public charge proposal. This includes 75,000 who must choose between accessing benefits they are legally entitled to or possible future adverse immigration consequences and 400,000 who are not currently eligible to receive benefits but would face possible future adverse immigration consequences due to their, due to their age, health, income, etc. Furthermore, this number does not include the additional hundreds of thousands of immigrant New Yorkers who may disenroll from or forego public benefits because of fear and confusion surrounding the proposed rule which unfortunately we, already, we are already witnessing in New York City and across the nation. For immigrant families who rely on public benefits but already experience barriers accessing benefits, this proposed rule would widen those existing gaps. 
For example, in the Asian Pacific Islander community, which has the highest rate of poverty of all racial ethnic groups in New York City at nearly 25%, APIs are frequently under-enrolled in health insurance and other social safety net programs despite their high need due to factors including limited outreach, language access, and funding. This proposed rule serves as another barrier that would prevent vulnerable immigrant communities from accessing benefits that are critical in caring for their health and well-being. However, this rule is not final. It is not final. It is not final. And until it is, we will continue to fight against it and with all of you. As part of this rulemaking process, members of the public may submit comments to the federal government about how this rule will impact them, their families, and their neighbors. The comment period ends on December 10th. The comment period ends on December 10th. And there are over 54,000 comments that have already been submitted and posted to the Federal Register. And I encourage you all to submit your comments as well, to add the collective voice opposing this inhumane policy. We have lap laptops here set up in the chambers so you can submit your own comment and I hope you will join us in sharing your own opposition, your own unique story to this proposed rule by submitting a comment today. And they are on that corner over there, raise your hand team. Thank you so much, team, for being here. We have laptops ready to submit your register. Can I just get a show of hands? How many people have already submitted something on behalf of yourself or your organization? Please raise your hand. Very cool. Thank you. Please raise your hand if you will commit in public. I don't think the camera is on you, but I'm going to take a picture. Because um, this, is, this is the kind of commitment that I want. How many of you will commit to putting a comment on the Federal Register? Raise your hand. All of you. And I want to take that very seriously here. Every voice should be heard in this city, in this country, and we're already at half of the proposed, not the proposed, we're already at half of the goal of 100,000 comments. If we can slow this down enough, we might win this battle on, pu on public charge. So I want to thank my staff as well, who has uh, helped and prepare this day today. My senior advisor, Cesar Vargas, uh, my chief of staff, Shoshiata Meng, my communications director, Tony Chiriato, and the whole community staff, the council, Harbani Ahuja, committee policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk, finan finance analyst, Jin Lee. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to my co-chair, Steve Levin. Thank you very much, Chairman Chaka. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. And I'm pleased to join my colleagues, Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, the Chair of the Immigration Committee, and Councilmember Mark Levine, Chair of the Health Committee, for this very important hearing on a very serious matter, the federal proposed public charge rule. The federal administration's public or proposed rule newly includes public benefits like Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, as an assessment of whether lawfully present immigrants deserve to stay in the country. SNAP is the cornerstone of the nation's safety net. And nutrition assistance programs providing assistance to millions of families to be able to provide food for their loved ones. In New York City alone, over 1.6 million residents depend on SNAP benefits to care for their families' well-being. The impact this would have on our city's communities cannot be overstated. SNAP helps lift families out of poverty and provides economic benefit for communities. Every SNAP dollar spent by recipients generates $1.79 in economic activity, and every $1 billion of SNAP benefits creates 9,000 full-time jobs. The economic uh, impact of this proposed rule on New York City would be devastating, potentially up to 25,000 full-time jobs. So when we talk about the Amazon uh, issue, that's how many jobs could be lost by this proposed rule alone. More importantly, we are concerned about the chilling effect that this could have on New York City and look forward to talking with the administration about what we can do to mitigate this. 
The proposed rule and leaked versions have already caused significant fear and confusion and could lead to hundreds of thousands of immigrant New Yorkers dropping out of benefit programs or not accessing services that they are eligible for, including those beyond the scope of the proposed rule. The Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infant, and Children, otherwise known as WIC, was included in earlier leaked drafts of the proposed rule change, but not, were not included in the final proposed rule. However, Public Health Solutions, which runs the largest community-based WIC program in New York State, has already seen large drops in enrollment in their WIC program following the leaked rule. Low-income women, including immigrant women, are disproportionately the primary or sole income earner in their households. The impact this would have on New York's families is alarming. This rule also comes at a time when the need for food assistance programs is greater than ever. According to the American Public Health Association, household food insecurity has jumped to 17.8% among immigrant families living in the United States in 2017 from 9.9% in 2007. How alarming is that? From 9.9% to 17.8% in just 10 years. We need to be expanding access to social services and food assistance, not making it harder for people to access basic programs. As SNAP and WIC enrollment decline, the capacity of food pantries is also likely to be strained. HRA, through the Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, administers funding and coordinates the distribution of shelf-stable food to more than 1,000 food pantries and community kitchens citywide, reaching a total of 1.4 million, million New Yorkers. And the need is increasing. Hunger Free America found that New York City's food pantries and soup kitchens fed 6% more people in 2017 than the previous year. This proposed public charge rule would likely further increase this demand. I want to thank Barry Grudenchik, uh, who's been our, uh, our champion here at the City Council over the last several years on expanding EFAP and been very successful in that endeavor. I want to thank the speaker as well. Today, we seek to learn how the proposed public charge rule could potentially impact immigrant, family, immigrant New Yorkers and their families and what we as a city can do to fight against it. I will say that this proposed rule comes from a mean, dark, xenophobic, and racist place. Sadly, these trends are not new in American society. Just go to Ellis Island to see the popular anti-immigrant sentiment at that time. But we have always fought against them and the voices of inclusion have always defeated the forces of exclusion. We must do this once again. I'd like to thank the general welfare staff for their work in preparing today's hearing, Council Aminta Kilowam, Policy Analyst Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, and Finance Analyst Julie Harmis, as well as Council staff from the Immigration and Health Committees. I'd also like to thank my Legislative Director, Elizabeth Adams, my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher. Lastly, I would like to thank the members of the administration who have come here to testify. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to our chair. Thank you. And uh, our chair for the Health Committee, Councilmember Mark Levine. Thank you, Chair Menchaca. Thank you, Chair Levin. Happy to be together in this very important fight. Immigrants are under assault in the Trump era on many, many fronts. And this hearing is focused on the latest line of attack. The public charge policy, unfortunately, is not getting the attention it deserves. And today is in part about shining a light on this and mobilizing the people of the city to push back. The truth is that this policy change is no less serious of a threat than the assaults on DACA, and certainly more imminent a threat than the President's absurd and outrageous idea of revoking birthright citizenship or his bizarre obsession with building the wall. This is a threat which is imminent and serious and must be confronted head on. And let me be clear about what's at stake in this public charge rule change. If this goes through, it will bring about nothing short of a public health crisis for this city and for this country. This rule change will mean reduced participation in Medicaid, reduced participation in SNAP, and housing assistance, and much, much more, as my colleagues have detailed. 
This means that families in this city will forego neonatal care. They will forego annual checkups and vaccinations and pre preventative health care in general. This rule change would exacerbate a frightening trend already underway in the Trump era of immigrants documented and otherwise showing greater and greater reluctance to go to see a doctor until they land in medical crisis, forcing them into the emergency room. This is already having alarming medical consequences, as we see, for example, in the resurgence of tuberculosis in New York City after decades of decline, a change that can almost exclusively be attributed to the reluctance of immigrants who are most vulnerable to contract this disease from seeking medical care because of the climate of fear created by the Trump administration. And the truth is that TB and all microbes, they don't care what your party registration is or what your documentation status is. They affect every segment of the population. So this hearing is in part about making it clear that what would perhaps seem like an obscure bureaucratic change in policy, in fact, would have deadly real-world consequences for immigrants, for their families, for all of us. And this city is going to do everything in our power to stop this threat, to embrace and support the immigrants who make this city the greatest city in the world. And we're going to protect our people in this era of attacks from a hostile administration of Washington. And as, as my colleagues have mentioned, every single person who is watching this hearing, who's taking part in this hearing in person or online, can and should make their voice heard. And as the chairman mentioned, um, if you're here in person, you'll have a chance to do that by offering a comment on one of the computers that we have available. If you're watching at home or following us online, you can too. There is a very simple URL you can visit, protectingimmigrantfamilies.org, which gives you a very simple, user-friendly way to speak out in your own words about why you see this as a threat to the well-being of this country. I look forward to uh, discussing with the administration about their plans to educate, to inform, and to mobilize, and of course hearing from our many important advocates for the immigrant community and people who themselves will be affected in our discussion today. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and back to you. Thank you, Chair Levine, and we are joined here by Council Members Jonai, Powers, Ayala, Salamanca, and Adams, and Drum, and Gredenchek. Thank you. And we are going to call our first panel. And this is our community panel. Catholic Charities, uh, Reluca, Uncho OK, we'll get your, your name. Uh, OK, first, that's Catholic Charities. The second one is CUNY Urban Food Policy. Professor Nicholas Frodenberg. And then the last one is Make the Road New York, Sienna Fontaine. We'll collect testimony over here. We want to give you each three minutes. We're going to be putting a clock on, on uh, our, our testimony. We have, we have many folks that want to testify today. We want to hear from everyone. So I, I appreciate if you, can, if you can use your testimony as an opportunity to focus on things that have not been spoken to uh, as, you, as we kind of go through the larger discussions uh, and, and really kind of focus on some of the things that we need to think about as a committee with members here present to listen. We've also been joined by Council Member uh, Alika Sam Amper Samuel. Uh, you can please start. Make sure that the, the light is red on the... <laughs> it is. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Raluca Onchoyu. I am the Director of Immigration Legal Services and the Immigration Hotline of Catholic Charities Community Services. 
Um, and I'm here today to testify both on behalf of the, our Division of Immigrant and Refugee Services and of our case management department about the effect that we're already seeing on the ground um, in our communities, even this, though at this point this rule is just a proposed rule and not a final rule. Um, what the proposed, as, as has already been said, what these proposed federal regulations do is significantly alter who will be granted a green card, who will get to extend their visas, and who will get to change their status. But it also sows confusion and uncertainty even among the people who would not be affected by it. I would like to tell you a little bit about the immigration hotline and the role that it's played so far in um, confronting this crisis of confusion. The hotline is a state-funded hotline. It's available toll-free, um, and it, its mission is twofold. It seeks to provide basic information, correct information to those who have immigration questions, not legal advice, just basic information, and then to give them referrals to nonprofit agencies that can offer them legal services for free. Um, one of the things that the hotline can do is uh, partner with media to hold phone banks whenever there are issues that um, are affecting large portions of our immigrant communities. These phone banks reach far and wide. They, would, they are not possible without partnership from the New York Immigration Coalition, city agencies, state agencies, and of course, other legal service providers who send us volunteers to um, increase capacity during the phone banks. Um, the phone banks are also a very effective means of communicating information and reducing confusion because they're televised and they feature interviews with attorneys who can answer questions. They also usually, uh, at the end of a phone bank, we would have either a town hall event or a Facebook Live panel, which can be accessed by a lot more people. Um, and I would tell you that in anticipation of the publication of these regulations, um, city agencies, the New York Immigration Coalition, other agencies that work with immigrants came together and put together a plan of how we will respond once the regulations are released. As part of this response, we organize a phone bank. The phone bank took place on October 2nd and October 3rd, and um, of course, Carlos Manchaca was on hand <laughs> to observe it, so thank you for that. And I will tell you a little bit about what we were able to tell from this phone bank. So on October 2nd, we had 20 volunteers, we answered 366 calls, and we made 542 referrals. On October 3rd, we had 25 volunteers, we answered 471 calls, and we made 692 referrals. The total for the two days was um, 837 calls and 1,233 referrals. The Facebook Live panel that concluded the, the phone bank on October 3rd reached more than 14,000 people and got more than 4,000 views. The calls revealed high levels of anxiety and confusion. Um, Although the proposed changes will not affect every immigrant family, what we saw is that those who believe that it will are making life-altering decisions that further entrench them in poverty. 40% of the calls we got were from legal permanent residents who are worried about renewing their green cards, traveling, or become, applying to become US citizens. A lot of them actually misunderstood the proposed regulations and thought that they would no longer be eligible for public benefits. 14% of the calls were from U.S. citizens who are concerned about the effect of their taking of public benefits would have on their ability to successfully petition for family members. 10% of them, of the calls, uh, were people who had pending applications or who were intending and had an, a possibility of applying for a green card and now they were worried that they wouldn't be able to do so because their family members had been receiving benefits. 6% of the calls were about benefits that would not even factor into a determination on public charge. So the benefits that were mentioned before, WIC, for example. 13% of the callers reported taking Medicaid, 10% reported taking SNAP, and 5% subsidized housing. In addition, in addition to these calls that came through the phone bank, the hotline also answered another 337 calls during October. This brings the total of calls about public charge that we answered to 1,107, 
I'm sorry, to 1,174 calls in the month of October. That's 36% of the total number of calls we received. If you compare this to September, um, in September we only had 34 calls about public charge. That was 2% of the calls that we received in September. So from 2% to 36%, people are worried. The calls that we received outside of the phone bank, again, 40% were from legal permanent residents who are convinced that the fact that they were taking benefits would um, disallow them from becoming citizens. We also anecdotally had two phone calls from U.S. citizens who were afraid they would be denaturalized because they were taking benefits. 23% of the calls we got um, concerned receipt of public benefits by U.S. citizens, including children, and how that would affect family members applying for green cards or visas. 17% of the callers were undocumented. Some had pending green card applications. 38% of all callers were receiving Medicaid. 33% were receiving SNAP. 17% subsidized housing and 8% SSI. 17% of the calls, again, were about benefits that would not be included on a, in a public charge determination um, and are not part of the proposed rules. I know I'm running out of time, but I wanted to tell you from our case management perspective an example of a real life story behind these numbers. Manuel is a day laborer. He lives with his wife and three U.S. citizen children. The family cobbles together income from various employment sources, much of which is seasonal and unpredictable. After much encouragement, the wife applied for SNAP for the children. Upon learning about the proposed change in the public charge rule, Manuel closed the case. All I want to do is work and take care of my family by myself. I'm a good worker. I can get another job. Manuel already works two jobs. When his case manager, manager reminded him that he can access food at our local food pantry and that there are no consequences under the proposed public charge rules for getting food from a food pantry, Manuel respectfully declined. One last story. Roberto is a 9-11 responder. He developed a de debilitating chronic illness as a result of his participation in the cleanup effort. He receives regular medical care at a local hospital and is described as a hard worker, kindly man, and someone who is very rule abiding. Roberto is in the process of fixing his immigration status. However, he does not currently have work authorization. Um, during most of the time in the U.S., Roberto lived with his brother who supported him throughout this process. But last year, his brother's failing health prompted him to relocate out of state to be with his children. Roberto remained in New York City but was unable to maintain the apartment. Unable to work or pursue public assistance, which he was afraid of doing, Roberto eventually had no recourse but to enter the shelter system, but he managed to make the best of it. It was always his intention to resume employment upon resolving his legal status. Recently, Roberto came to the hospital uncharacteristically unkempt. When his nurse took his vitals, it was clear that his health was deteriorating. It was then when he revealed that he left the shelter because of the proposed change in the public charge rule. He was under the impression that being in a shelter with will disqualify him from ever legalizing his status in the U.S. He was now sleeping in 24-7 um, you know, store at night and uh, staying in various coffee shops during the day. He ate in soup kitchen and gathered recyclables to redeem for cash. He walked to his appointment at the hospital on an empty stomach from Brooklyn to Manhattan. Those are just some of the stories behind the numbers that we're hearing through the hotline. I want to conclude by saying that um, the hotline is ready at any point to partner with everyone um, who's concerned about this, to hold more, um, pub, uh, more, more phone banks, more Facebook Live panels, because it's a very efficient way of getting the message out there. Thank you. Can you give us the number of this hotline, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> I should do that. Um, and I should know it by heart. It is 800-566-7636. 800-566-7636. And it operates Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. It's toll free. And um, we speak up to 200 languages for an interpreter service. Our operators speak eight languages. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say, we're going to try to keep it to time, but I think what was really important is the data and the stories that are behind the fear that we're 
trying to understand right now. So thank you so much for the, uh, the fullness of your testimony today. Thank you. Professor? Yes, good afternoon, thank you. Make sure your mic is on. Uh, you, yeah. I'm Nicholas Freudenberg, Distinguished Professor of Public Health at the City University of New York School of Public Health and the Director of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Our institute provides evidence, policy analysis and advocacy, and assistance to other organizations to help solve urban food problems. And I'm honored to testify at today's hearing and to assess the impact of the proposed change in rules regarding the public charge determination for non-citizens. While the proposed changes have the potential to produce a variety of negative health, social, and economic consequences, my testimony will focus on the impact on food security for immigrant families and communities in New York City. And while this hearing is focused on the proposed change in public charge rules, it is important to note that the White House and congressional Republicans have enacted or proposed other changes that could worsen food insecurity here in New York City. These include proposed cuts in SNAP funding, new work requirements for SNAP beneficiaries, more aggressive enforcement of immigration rules, and a concerted campaign to raise the level of fear among immigrants. Because each of these changes has the potential to exacerbate the negative impact of the others, in my testimony today, I'm gonna to discuss the cumulative consequences of the cascade of proposed policy changes rather than only focus on the public charge rule. And I think the study that uh, Chairman Levin quoted before, uh, released this week by the American Public Health Association, provides the first scientific evidence of the fact that this proposed change is already having an impact, and that reinforces the anecdotal impressions that I think many of us in the room already have. Why is food insecurity and food security important in New York City? A robust body of public health evidence demonstrates the negative consequences of food insecurity and hunger on children, families, and communities. Compared to food secure individuals, those experiencing food insecurity are at higher risk of behavioral and cognitive problems, coronary heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, depression, physical inactivity, and poor health status. Food insecure learners of all ages, from preschool to college, are less likely to achieve academic success than their food secure peers. And our studies at CUNY have identified about 60,000 food insecure students at the City University of New York, many of whom are immigrants. Food insecurity is also associated with overweight and obesity, since those with inadequate resources for food are more likely to choose the less expensive, calorie-dense, but nutrient-poor foods. A study that we published... Professor, I'm going to ask you to pause here. Can you, can you skip over to the policy recommendations and options that you have? Yes, uh, thank you. And I think the uh, key challenge for the city council and for all of us in the room is to say, what are we gonna do about this? And in the coming weeks, uh, our institute, in consultation and in partnership with several food security and immigrant service organizations, will propose a set of policy and funding recommendations that will enable an immediate response to the threat of growing food insecurity. And we welcome your feedback and the participation and partnership of other groups. So here are a few of the ideas we're proposing. That we add incentives or discounts for healthy food to IDNYC, the New York City Municipal Identification Card. There are already some food benefits. City Council funding for more would put uh, healthy food in reach. We propose increasing the number of trusted community sites, churches, schools, community agencies, where immigrants and other food secure, insecure families can pick up food. The notion of being able to trust the place where you get food is something we heard repeatedly in our interviews and survey. Third, we propose expanding support for emergency food programs to use mobile technology to schedule 
visits or deliver food to users' homes to allay immigrants' concerns about frequenting public places. Fourth, we propose strengthening the infrastructure for distributing and storing healthy food in programs that are already serving food to vulnerable populations. Many frontline groups report difficulties in serving the people who come to them because of inadequate infrastructure and staffing. We propose enabling community organizations to expand outreach and education to ensure that food insecure individuals, whatever their immigration status, are welcome and to lead campaigns against stigma. And finally, we support providers serving immigrant populations to supplement federally supported benefits for non-citizen family members, such as summer meals for parents and older uh, siblings of school children eligible for federal program to use city and state fundings to supplement those federal programs to provide additional food. As the city's immigrant populations become more vulnerable and afraid of using public benefits, city and state officials can also strengthen and enforce vigorously other policies that support their economic well-being from enforcement of wage laws and minimum wage to access to affordable housing. And this puts more money in the pockets of immigrants and allows them to get more food. So Professor, Ultimately, I'll pause, you, I'll pause you there. I want to go to the next panel and know that we have your written statements. And we want to work with you to develop these concepts and ideas. And so I hope that you can work with us in the committees to further that. Concept. We're committed to doing that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. <coughs> Thank you, council members, um, the Committees on Immigration, General Welfare and Health. My name is Sienna Fontaine. I'm the co-legal director at Make the Road New York. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today um, regarding this proposed rule. Um, as we've already heard and as we'll hear throughout the, the rest of the day, the proposal has already begun to have the impact uh, that we can agree it was intentionally uh, uh, designed to have, striking fear uh, in the hearts and minds of immigrant communities. This is a direct attack, um, as was said, uh, mentioned earlier. Um, as you know, Make the Road New York is a nonprofit community-based membership organization with over 23,000 low-income members dedicated to building the power of immigrant and working-class communities to achieve dignity and justice through organizing, policy, innovation, transformative education, and survival services. We operate five community centers in Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, Long Island, and now Westchester. So I'm gonna pause you there and mm -hmm. ask you to go right to sure. your recommendations. Sure. Please. Um, so as you can see, uh, we have a, uh, a story in our testimony. Um, I think the, the important thing here is uh, the information that needs to be um, uh, uh, put out and the campaign that we need to really engage in to inform our communities. We have seen hundreds of folks um, re coming into our offices just recently um, and you know wanting to know about what they should do, that they're planning to disenroll. Um, and for the most part, there are many people who are eligible and will not be impacted by this rule. And so the, the information campaign that the city has already begun to engage in with Make the Road, with other providers in this room, is going to be critical. Another piece that is not mentioned in the testimony, but is the information that, uh, that private attorneys in the private bar and immigration attorneys um, are sharing with their clients and encouraging them to get off of benefits when they shouldn't be. And so I think it's going to be critical to, to figure out resources and ways to really get to the bar uh, and, and private attorneys who are not um, necessarily engaged in some of the work that folks here are to make sure that they are not giving incorrect recommendations to their clients um, and, and it's striking fear in doing that. Um, and so that's something that we, that, that we hope that the city council will really engage in and work with us on um, in terms of this intense kind of campaign to make sure that the information is out there. Um, we list you know, the other policy recommendations, um, working with community-based organizations to supplement um, the services that we know that they will need as they disenroll despite the campaign of information that we hope to engage in. Um, increasing those immigration uh, legal services and, and legal services for benefits providers who are going to be on the front lines in doing screenings. 
Um, and lastly, uh, we really encourage the city, um, which I know we'll be discussed later, but to submit comments um, strongly opposing this and really highlighting the, um, the, the introduction of heavily uh, weighted negative factors um, and its discriminatory um, intent. And so we hope that the city will, will take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank all of you for really helping set the tone for the different areas of impact. Uh, and each and every one of you are going to be part of our kind of collective city work to further not just the outreach campaign, but get to the root of not just the fear, but the return to access of all these programs that are available, especially for those who are just under enrolled. And I think that's been a theme here in this first panel. Uh, and if it's okay with the chairs, I'm going to move to the to the next piece, unless they have questions. Um, I want to welcome a uh, thank you to the first panel for, for again for setting the tone for this. Uh, I want to I want to hand it over to our speaker Corey Johnson, uh, who never fails to join and lead uh, in real strong voice for every New Yorker, including our immigrant New Yorkers. The, we know that the work that the council is going to do is going to require the. Uh, the most from every single one of us, and I think he's going to be at the front of all of this as we move forward to find solutions. Speaker? Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Chaka. As uh, the chair said, uh, my name is Corey Johnson. I'm Speaker of the New York City Council. And I want to thank the chairs of the Immigration, General Welfare, and Health Committees, Council Members Carlos Menchaca, Steve Levin, and Mark Levine, for spearheading the Council's effort to hold our government accountable to the city's immigrant residents and their families. We are proudly a sanctuary city. In this mind-boggling time, when our military, our proud service members that we honored over the weekend, are deployed to bar entry to a group of asylum seekers in a brazen political stunt that serves no legitimate purpose. During these times, we want New York City to stand as a beacon on a hill, showing a different way and path forward. Ever since the first leak, of a public charge rule in February of 2018, we have been preparing for this hearing, especially Chairman Chaka, and the work that still remains to establish a path forward for all immigrant New Yorkers that does not undermine our city's policymaking authority for our residents and does not result in a public health crisis that I fear is looming on the horizon because of this inhumane proposal. While some form of a public charge rule has been part of U.S. immigration law for more than 100 years, the federal government, as you've heard in the opening statements and in the first panel, and I want to thank those panelists for being here, the, government is, the federal government is now proposing a rule that would drastically, dramatically reduce the number of people eligible for a green card or a visa. This includes significantly expanding the list of public benefits that are subject to, to a public charge determination, such as SNAP, non-emergency Medicaid, Medicare Part D, and federally funded housing assistance. Forcing individuals to forgo accessing critical benefits that they are eligible for, mothers, children, the elderly, is cruel and is un-American. This is not a surprise, sadly, from a man who came to the White House promising to build a wall. I saw on CNN when I was walking up here, he's meeting with uh, Republican senators right now to continue talking about uh, the wall, uh, to build a wall to divide us, and who has ramped up a war on immigrants with cruel policy after cruel policy. It is not a surprise, but it is certainly a total disgrace and one that we will not let pass by without putting up a fight. Today, I am sponsoring two resolutions that are being heard by these committees. Resolution 609 calls on the federal government to reconsider its proposed public charge rule. The underlying assumption of public charge is that individuals only have value if they are 100% self-sufficient from birth to grave. It doesn't take an expert to realize the logical fallacy in such a crazy assumption. Sometimes people need a little help. There's really no shame in that. 
People say people need to be pulled up by their bootstraps. If you don't have bootstraps, how are you gonna get pulled up? My own family struggled when I was a child. We lived in public housing when I was nine years old until I graduated high school at 18 years old, and thank God we had it. I am now Speaker of the New York City Council, serving the city that I love as best as I can, and I wouldn't have got here today if it wasn't for the help that's been provided to me. What this policy is doing is making it so that people who need some help, food, food stamps, or Medicaid, or housing assistance like my family had, they are now being told they are not welcome here in our country. That is absurd. Our immigrant neighbors and friends contribute every day so much to this city and to this country. Like many native-born Americans, they sometimes need a helping hand. There is nothing wrong with that. Let's not penalize them for it. And if you look at the big picture, we are not just penalizing them. Our society as a whole will suffer. Across the nation, we are already seeing a drop in enrollment for benefit programs included and excluded from the rule because of the fear this has incited. If families, if children lose access to SNAP, housing assistance, Medicaid, and Medicare Part D, we will invariably see rises in homelessness, taxed food pantries, and higher rates of reliance on emergency rooms and hospitals across this city and across the country. I don't think anyone wants that or in any way thinks that it is helpful to our city or to our country. I look forward to hearing from this administration who has been a great partner on all of the work we've done on immigration. I want to thank the Moya Commissioner for being here and for her steadfast and consistent leadership. Uh, I look forward to hearing from them about any changes in enrollment that they are seeing and ways in which they are planning to respond programmatically to the heightened need of New Yorkers resulting from this proposed rule. And I hope that we come away from today with an accurate picture of the proposed public charge rule and a renewed promise to immigrant New Yorkers and their families that the city of New York not only values its foreign-born residents, but is also committed to their success by offering city-funded benefits and programs unaffected by this proposed rule. I also want to talk briefly about Resolution 608, which authorizes myself, the Speaker of the City Council, to submit a public comment as part of this process on behalf of the entire City Council, calling on the federal government to reconsider its proposed rule regarding the public charge. As part of the federal rulemaking process, all members of the public are invited to submit a comment concerning the real life impact this rule uh, might have should it go into effect. While this resolution would authorize me to submit a public comment on behalf of the City Council, on behalf of the municipal legislature in the City of New York, I know that the most valuable comments are honestly not from me. They are from those made by members of the public who would be directly affected by this rule, whether that be in your families, your neighborhoods, or your jobs. We have laptops set up for the public who is here today to complete a comment uh, before you leave, or you can submit a comment on your own time by going to regulations.gov. The comment period will close December 10th, 2018 at 11.59 p.m. I am proud, so proud, to serve in such a diverse city, and I have no intention of standing idly by, none of us do, in this council, as this federal administration targets our residents and immigrants across this country. I hope you will join me in sharing your own dissatisfaction and disgust with this new rule by submitting a public comment. Again, I want to thank uh, Chairs Menchaca, Levin, and Levine for your commitment to this issue. I especially want to thank my dear friend, uh, Carlos Menchaca, who has been an incredible leader on all issues related to immigrants and immigration in our city, never uh, stopping to stopping the drum on behalf of immigrants who are affected. And I, I really am grateful we're having this hearing today. You know, it, it there is something so uh, wrong and despicable with the assault and uh, cruel and inhumane measures that are being proposed every single day 
by Stephen Miller and other uh, racist, xenophobic folks inside of the White House. And at every opportunity that we have as a body, we will stand up, we will fight back, we will publicly fight back, because we know what is at stake here. We know what history teaches us when segments of society are targeted and targeted and scapegoated. And uh, it becomes, I guess, a bit of a daily nightmare. And uh, it's not, of course, as traumatic for me as it is for folks who have to go through living under this fear and cloud. But this weighs on all of us psychologically to have to be able to see what's going on. And I believe when history looks back, they will ask who spoke up and who didn't speak up. And when history is written, they will see that this city council stood up and spoke up. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, uh, for your words and your encouragement and that leadership that we're gonna need every single day as we fight, not just on public charge, but really everything that is um, in an onslaught impacting our immigrant families. With that, we are gonna hear from our administration. And we have here uh, leading the administration's testimony, Commissioner Bita Mustafi. Uh, we have also Grace Bonilla from the New York City Human Resources Administration, HRA, and Sonia, uh, uh, the Deputy Commissioner at DOHMH. Angel? Angel. 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 We are gonna swear you in now. Uh, thank you for much, so much for being here today. And if you can all raise your right hand, our council will swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank I you. Do. Thank you to the speaker, Chair Levin, Chair Levine, and Chairman Chaka, and members of the committees on general welfare, health, and immigration. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the commissioner for the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I'm joined today by my colleagues from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Department of Social Services. Thank you very much for calling a hearing on this important topic. The foundation of a fair and just society is the moral responsibility we carry to help those in need. That responsibility underlies the work that city agencies do every day. Whether we are providing medical care to pregnant women, helping families get the food they need, or assisting tenants to afford their rent, ultimately we are doing this because we understand that helping those in need is the right thing to do. The Trump administration's proposed rule on inadmissibility on public charge grounds, by contrast, is an un-American, immoral attack on hardworking immigrant members of our society, and one that is cruelly designed to inflict harm. The proposed rule would have a devastating effect in New York City if finalized. One of the most insidious aspects of this proposal is that it has already created widespread confusion and fear even though no change has taken effect. I want to repeat, no change has taken effect. I also want to emphasize to the community that the city's services are still available and will remain available even if the proposed rule were to ever be finalized. Starting from when the proposed rule was still a rumor, the administration has worked with other city agencies and local, state, and national partners to counteract fear and misinformation. We have worked to educate and inform the community, helped people access one-on-one -on -one support, and facilitated opportunities for concerned New Yorkers to make their voices heard. In my testimony today, I will give a brief overview of the proposed public charge rule, its harms, uh, the harms that it will inflict on New York City and New Yorkers, and will then describe the steps that the city has taken since the proposed rule was published and our plan for opposing the rule moving forward. Existing immigration laws provide that an Im applicant for admission to the United States who is or is likely to become a public charge can be denied a green card or visa. For the past 20 or so years, this analysis was limited to considering receipt of cash assistance for income maintenance or government-supported institutionalization for long-term care. This limitation was intended to end the damaging confusion and fear about who would face negative immigration consequences and to alleviate dangerous public health and nutrition consequences. 
Despite this long-standing policy, on October 10th, the federal government published a rule that would create a much broader definition of public charge. The proposed rule would do this by expanding the list of public benefits that would be considered and by changing the way immigration authorities determine whether someone is likely to become a public charge. If the proposed rule were adopted, the list of public benefits to be considered would be much broader than just the cash assistance and institutionalization for long-term care as is the practice now. The proposal would also consider supplemental nutritional assistance program, also called food stamps, non-emergency Medicaid, low-income subsidies for Medicare Part D for prescription drugs, and public housing and Section 8 vouchers and rental assistance. In addition, the proposed rule would change the way immigration authorities consider the likelihood that someone will become a public charge. Under current law and policy, the government weighs fa various factors, such as age, health, and income, to determine whether someone will become a public charge. But someone who presents an affidavit of support from a friend or family member, for example, is generally not considered likely to become a public charge regardless of these other factors. By contrast, the proposed rule would require each factor to be considered separately. This would make it much more probable that immigrants would be considered likely to be a public charge, even if they have never been eligible for benefits or received benefits, and even if they have an affidavit of support. Taken together, this proposed rule represents a dramatic departure from existing federal policy that will harm low- and middle-income immigrant families. Because of the great degree of misinformation and anxiety that has surrounded this proposal, I want to address a number of things that this rule would not do. Notably, the published proposed rule is more limited than some leaked drafts and does not reach as far as some rumors have suggested. First, the only public benefits that the proposed rule would treat as negative factors would be those expressly listed. There are many benefits that are not enumerated in the proposal, including WIC, reduced price or free school lunches, emergency medical assistance, discounted health care services for the uninsured, foster care and adoption, Head Start, and other benefits. These benefits and others not listed would not be counted against an applicant for a green card or a visa. Second, the proposed rule would only apply to benefits after the, the rule is finalized. It is not proposed to be retroactive. An individual's receipt or benefits today and up until a final rule takes effect would not be considered in a public charge determination. Third, the proposed rule would only consider an applicant's own use of making a, uh, benefits when making the public charge determination. Benefits used by a child, a spouse, family or household members or other dependents would not be considered as a negative factor concerning an application. Last, the proposed rule exempts many categories of immigrants from its scope based on immigration law. Public charge and admissibility does not apply to green card holders and applicants for citizenship. The rule also excludes refugees and asylees, applicants and re-registrants from temporary protected status, special immigrant juveniles, self-petitioners under the Violence Against Women Act, U visa holders, and others. The proposed rule has not gone into effect. But if finalized, the proposed rule would harm hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. As written, the proposed rule would force many immigrants to choose between access to crucial public benefits and regularizing their immigration status. This impossible choice has already created anxiety and confusion that existing federal policy, as I noted, was meant to prevent. We have heard disturbing reports, as we did from the panel previously, about immigrants withdrawing from or considering withdrawal from public services due to this confusion. We are deeply concerned about these reports, and we're committed to monitoring and combating this fear. These harms are not unintended side effects. This proposed rule appears to be designed to hurt hardworking immigrant families in the name of self-sufficiency. The city wants New Yorkers, including immigrants, to access our benefits and services because these services help people get the assistance they need so that they can get back on their feet. 
New York City knows that immigrants make us stronger. We reject the lie that immigrants are a drain on our resources. As just one example, in 2017, immigrants con contributed an estimated $195 billion to the city's GDP, or about 22% of our overall GDP. If it goes into effect, the proposed rule will have grave effects on public health and general well-being of New Yorkers. I want to highlight the broad harms that the rule could cause. If the rule were finalized, we estimate up to 475,000 immigrant New Yorkers could be directly harmed. Up to 75,000 of those immigrants are currently eligible for crucial benefits and may be forced to choose between receiving those benefits and future adverse immigration consequences. But the bulk of those who could be directly harmed, some 400,000 immigrants, are those not eligible for benefits, but who, who could be deemed a public charge in an immigration application simply because of their age, their health condition, education, employment history, or income and assets, among other factors. We fear that hundreds of thousands more New Yorkers, including US citizens and immigrants who are not subject to the proposed rule, may withdraw from benefits or forgo benefits for which they are eligible. We are already working to combat this large-scale chilling effect. Lastly, the proposed rule would hurt the city's economy. If finalized, we estimate that the city's economy would lose at least $420 million annually in public benefits, support, and economic activity. I want to emphasize for New Yorkers that this proposed rule has not gone into effect. It remains possible that the proposed rule will never go into effect. Moreover, even if the rule were to go into effect, it would not change eligibility requirements for public benefits programs. The proposal is exactly that, a proposal that must face public scrutiny and comment the, pu the public can weigh in on the proposed rule until December 10th, and I encourage interested New Yorkers to make their voices heard by submitting comments as you can do here today. Turning to the city's response to the proposal, the city has tracked this issue closely since the first days of the Trump administration when a leaked draft executive order revealed that the administration intended to target immigrant use of public benefits. Our focus throughout this process has been ensuring that the community and stakeholders have information they needed, encouraging individuals to make their voices heard about the potential proposal and providing avenues for New Yorkers to get more information and the help that they need. Once the leaked draft regulations appeared in the media in early 2018, Moya immediately began working with our sister agencies. We worked to ensure that New York City's immigrant communities and other cities were well informed about the issue. We briefed agency heads and city leadership in the spring and dedicated a session to this issue at the Cities for Action Conference in May. After the Department of Homeland Security posted the draft language of the rule, we immediately began working to analyze the proposal and formulate a response. Shortly after, we produced talking points for agency staff and a public-facing information flyer in all of the city's local law languages. Through interagency collaboration with DOHMH, DSS, New York City Health and Hospitals, and other agencies, we were able to distribute information about the public charge rule to thousands of frontline staff. Commissioner Banks sent a letter to staff noting that no policies had changed on the federal or citywide level. Dr. Katz sent a similar letter to New York City Health and Hospital staff. h and also published a Public Charge 101 column in its all-staff weekly newsletter and hosted a webinar open to all staff led by the New York Legal Assistance Group. During this time, the city also worked with Catholic Charities, as you heard, the Hispanic Federation, New York Immigration Coalition, Univision, the state's Office of New Americans, and LDREO to organize a phone bank and Facebook Live event to help provide accurate and important information to the public. As you heard, 43, 43 volunteers answered about 800 calls and made over 1,200 referrals, and 14,000 people viewed the Facebook Live event. 
Many of the calls to the phone bank were from lawful permanent residents concerned about accessing benefits. Many of the Facebook Live questions were from immigrants concerned that their usage of public benefits would impact their ability to petition for family members in the US and abroad. The administration also hosted a community and ethnic media roundtable on public charge and the 2020 census as part of City Hall in your borough in Queens, where I spoke alongside Deputy Mayor Thompson, Commissioner Banks, HRA Administrator Bonilla, Elmhurst Hospital CEO Israel Rocha. We provided information about the scope of the rule, the harms to immigrant New Yorkers, and emphasized that services remain available to all regardless of immigration status. The city is continuing to organize Know Your Rights events across the city and for different communities to circulate accurate information about the scope of the proposed rule and how individuals can get the help that they need. These efforts to provide accurate information are a crucial part of our effort to mitigate the fear and the harm that we already saw building in our communities. The city and its services remain open. New Yorkers are afraid or need help. They should con connect with Action NYC by calling 311 and saying Action NYC. We've also had mul held multiple briefings for different advocates and elected representatives. In October, we worked with the council and its members to hold a briefing for staff. We also held briefings for the state and federal elected officials, the borough presidents, poverty advocates, faith leaders, and multiple consulates. Our goal has been to make sure that many partners across the city are educated on this issue so that they can integrate this issue into their work and weigh in on the proposed rule. We are also engaged in advocacy in opposition of the rule. We've consistently and publicly denounced the Trump administration's proposal to punish immigrants and their families for seeking help they need. Moya and our sister agencies are currently working with other cities to develop comments on the proposed rule. We are also working to activate community members, advocates, and community-based organizations to weigh in and communicate their views. All New Yorkers are welcome and encouraged to make their voices heard on this important issue. We've tried to make this easier um, in providing a portal through our website. New Yorkers can simply go to nyc.gov forward slash public charge to read about the rule and submit comments directly to the federal government. The public charge proposed rule has shown why it's so vital for the city to provide immigration legal services. The best way for New Yorkers to understand how the proposed rule might affect them is by seeking immigration legal services. With the historic investment in legal services from the mayor and the city council, Moya has been able to work with other city agencies, legal services provider community, and community partners to provide high quality immigration legal services and help for community providers build their own capacity. Action NYC provides Providers have already been trained on public charge and are ready and able to provide individual guidance to immigrant New Yorkers. We have also worked, as noted, with the Office for New Americans hotline operated by Catholic Charities to ensure community members can reach reliable information and get referrals. I want to thank the committee chairs for calling this important hearing and for the work that you are doing to make sure communities have good information at this time. The Trump administration's proposed rule on public charge is a hateful and draconian attack on immigrants working to make ends meet and keep food on the table. And it is vitally important for us to share accurate information and make sure that all New Yorkers know how to make their voices heard. We are gravely concerned both by the anti-immigrant sentiment behind the proposed rule and by the havoc it will wreak on our neighbors, family members, and communities. The de Blasio administration knows that the contributions of immigrant New Yorkers are a central part of what makes the city and country great. I am proud to stand alongside my colleagues across the administration, in the city council, and in our provider community to fight this proposed rule and work to ensure that all New Yorkers feel safe and welcome getting the help that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and to your team here and for answering questions. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a first question and hand it over to, to the speaker and anyone else who, wants, who has questions as, uh, on the chair, for the chairs. And, and really when I'm thinking about the first panel and thinking about the hotline and what we're seeing already and the shifts in the hotline and the questions and the data that was presented, the stories about families who aren't even impacted by the public charge uh, proposal 
or even public charge at all are having an impact, the healthcare crisis that we were already seeing and the food access issues, what is the most important thing, the single most important thing that you think this city's administration should be focused on right now? What, what is, out of all those things that are being presented to us, it's incredibly overwhelming. What's the single most important thing that you think we should be focusing on and, and, and how, are you, how are you putting resources towards that goal? Um, so I'll say a couple of things. I think top line, as you heard throughout the testimony, we think the most important thing is to fight back, um, ensuring that there isn't a final rule that ever goes into effect that would, in fact, inflict this harm on our communities. Um, we feel as though there's something to be celebrated, even if a small sliver of hope in the work that advocates, cities, other leaders did to push back against the broad leaked drafts and narrowing the scope of what was ultimately proposed, but there's still work to be done and we are centrally focused on ensuring that we're doing everything at our, in our means to push back against a rule ever being finalized. I think secondarily, we, we know that that chilling effect um, is already real and well underway. Um, it, it's not uh, you know, rocket science to say that we need to do everything in our power in all of the different channels at our disposal to saturate good information and connect people to resources and services. We've done that in many of the ways that we articulated, but our focus is really in, in that campaign to ensure that communities know that this is not a final rule, that they know that there are resources immediately available to them to get good information on what their individual impact might look like, um, and then for us to continue to work with our agencies to monitor what the impact is on the ground in terms of benefit utilization. And very technically speaking, uh, and, and really thinking about worst case scenario, if we do not win this battle at the federal level on public charge, and that the public charge, even with our 100,000 um, unique stories that should be enough to change the federal government, that we have a very specific problem in front of us. And it's not just impacted directly folks that will be impacted by public charge, but it's essentially a larger group of folks, even non-immigrants in our neighborhoods on the healthcare issue. So, so what we're really speaking about here is, is increasing the access to services and really ensuring that no barrier exists and that the city understand the need there. And in some ways we kind of do know some of that need. A lot of it is information and confusion, but essentially what we're saying is that the city is gonna have to then provide, and the state, so I kind of want to hear from you on that. What essentially, at worst case scenario, um, are we doing to rev up for that? And what is administration doing to be ready to say, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of our New Yorkers, and here's the plan? Um, you know, so I'll, I'll say we are singularly focused at this moment on mitigating the chilling effect and pushing back against the rule. We are in parallel working on the, the drafting of a comment that we will submit. And in doing that work, we are, we are assessing with our sister agencies what they're seeing and what they're hearing in terms of what the real um, impact looks like. Um, we have talked to organizations and others and had our own internal conversations around what would happen if this went into effect and how could the city look at addressing uh, the real concerns we have around access. So those are conversations that we have begun in parallel to the work that we're doing. As I noted, we welcome uh, feedback, the recommendations and ongoing conversations um, around uh, what, what would look like the right approach in ensuring that that access is not chilled. Okay, I'm gonna hand this over to Speaker Corey Johnson. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you all for being here today, for everything you're doing. Thank you for your detailed testimony and for the proactive, coordinated approach that you all have taken since this first leaked. I, I really, really appreciate it. I have a, a couple of questions. <clears throat> of course, we hope this rule is not enacted, uh, but if for some reason it is in the way that's been proposed, uh, what do you think will be the immediate short-term and long-term needs of the impacted populations? 
Thank you for the question. So we did, we did release the preliminary analysis that we spoke to um, in the testimony, um, and we are looking even further um, at understanding what the impact would look like beyond that um, as a way of kind of taking the methodology that we already put forward on an impact analysis and going even deeper um, in understanding what we think the ramifications will be. In doing that, we are also, uh, as I noted, in parallel working with agencies who are in direct communication with frontline staff, um, having both shared information on resources with them, but also receiving information from staff on impact, and I can turn to my colleagues to add to that. Um, I think, you know, we, we have consistently in response to these federal proposals from the proposal to terminate DACA to TPS and others, really focused on making sure that we are engaged with the community and with providers and partners so that we can be adequately responsive. We have been monitoring closely the calls that are coming into our Action NYC hotline to understand are we you know, do we need more resources there? Are we at capacity? Are we able to uh, connect people with the resources that they need immediately? Um, and we're gonna continue to do that work kind of across all benefits utilization that the city administers. And, and where do you see gaps in existing services as we have to prepare for the worst? Where do you think those gaps exist right now? Sure. So as, as we look at what we're doing at uh, HRA, one of the things that has been wonderful about the partnership that we have with the city is that we have in our short history seen that we've been able to fight back what uh, the federal administration has put forward. HEAP last year was a perfect example. I believe Commissioner Banks was in the middle of a budget testimony wondering what we would do about HEAP when it was said that it would be taken off, the, uh, the federal government would no longer fund HEAP. That did not happen. Uh, so I. I, I believe that what the commissioner is saying is exactly true. Uh, we have recent history that says that if we all work together, there are certain things that will not happen that we can push back with the federal government. While we are having conversations about what we would need to do to mitigate any damages, we are singularly focused on making sure that we are responding to this rule and that we can mitigate those damages. For example, SNAP is something that is new. It's, it wasn't in uh, the regulation before. We're hoping that we can push that back. We have not seen an impact uh, where we could say that our, our numbers have changed because of this rule. Um, so we are, again, looking at everything that you're pointing to, Speaker, but we have not seen anything that points to the fact that we should start having those conversations uh, without really fighting back this rule. Thank you. Um, Dr. Angel, I wanted to ask you about a uh, health impact. Of course, we know that SNAP, Medicaid, Medicare Part D, housing assistance benefits uh, more than just an individual uh, they, that, that they're receiving. It also it has uh, indirect impacts or direct impacts on other members of the household uh, that are living with someone who may qualify for these benefits. Um, and some of those folks are folks who likely are U.S. citizens. Uh, as you work to quantify the impact of the new rule, how are you thinking about the health impacts on New York City households? And if the rule's enacted, how do you propose to ensure that we continue to strengthen the health and well-being of people who are affected? Yeah, this is of, of considerable concern, obviously, because as you mentioned, it's not just the individual, it's the family, and I would also say the community at large that's impacted by that experience. Um, as an agency, we, uh, 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 maintain a very high level of technical understanding of the impact of, for example, pe people not seeking treatment for an infectious disease, which then uh, might have a, a knock-on effect in terms of others in the community who might, um, who might uh, then contract it. Um, we worry very much about, for example, if people don't seek services for TB treatment as a result of this, uh, uh, don't go to our sexual health clinics as a result of this. Based upon our understanding of treatment, we can then understand the larger impact that it has. We are in a position that we can model the broader impact of it, but I will echo what my um, colleagues here are saying is that the most important thing at this time is that we 
mitigate the impact of this chilling effect right now because we remain and have always been open to services regardless of the immigration status. We don't ask about immigration status when we provide our services. And so the most important thing is that we ensure people that, that they can continue to seek safely the services that they need now to keep themselves and their community healthy. I'll just add one more thing to that, which is to say that we one of the things that we did was we cross-trained city outreach workers, including the public engagement unit that cover, does get covered and, and speaks to individuals around uh, health access. So they have been trained on what this is. They know how to be responsive and direct people to additional questions or individual questions that they might have. Uh, and a part of that, of course, is um, a, at this time, using kind of everything at our disposal and assessing if there are additional gaps and making sure people have that information and know what they can access in terms of health and other needs. Commissioner, uh, how many people work at Moya? What's your head count? Um, so Moya, uh, our, our head count, I'll have to get back to you exactly on. We work um, in partnership with other agencies, including HRA, DSS, and DCAS, and have about 70 individuals who work across uh, these agencies that focus on this work, including outreach work. But approximately, how many people just work in your agency? Approximately seven, just in the agency. Well, you, uh, you didn't expect this question, and uh, it wasn't planted by you to me, uh, but <laughs> given everything that you have had to grapple with as a small agency, I'm glad we're having uh, budget hearings uh, for your agency now that the chair had conducted this past budget cycle, and we're going to continue. Um, I think part of the conversation that we have to have, even though you have these great sister agencies with folks who are working on this, like the the two amazing uh, folks that uh, you're seated in between. Uh, I think everything that you're having to deal with, we need to have a conversation about what other infrastructure Moya needs uh, to be able to continue this coordination work, the proactive work, the advocacy, uh, that you're getting the support that you need. I think it's a very important uh, conversation to have, and I look forward to uh, understanding what those potential needs are. Uh, before the budget process begins so that we can continue to support the great work that you've done. I just have two more quick things. Allowing for privacy concerns, does the administration have a sense of the numbers of public housing residents in New York City who may face adverse consequences pursuant to this new rule should it go into effect? No, I think what's important to emphasize here is that individuals who are actually eligible for those kinds of services are not immediately impacted by this, right? Um, you know, one of the sort of false narratives that's spun is that immigrants, um, particularly undocumented or other immigrants, are reaping benefits. Uh, uh, utilization, and that's absolutely not true. Um, and so uh, what we are more concerned about in those contexts is just that broader chilling effect and confusion around people not necessarily readily understanding that it doesn't apply to them, uh, and making sure that through all of our agencies, we're sharing the message so that they can address individual questions or concerns from residents. And what efforts and how many languages and with what frequency has the administration attempted to explain the proposed rule change uh, with uh, potentially affected individuals? Um, so a number of things to date, though more to, more to do, certainly. Um, one was a community and ethnic media roundtable where we had um, media from sort of a very diverse set of outlets um, uh, representing various languages, of course. Um, we've translated our public-facing flyer into the, the local law 30 languages, so the top 10 languages, and have distributed that widely and as needed. Um, we obviously did the um, phone banking in the Spanish language. We're looking at doing something similar in other languages. We've set up community-based forums and um, provided interpretation in the language that the community or provider has requested. We've done that now at a few different locations and we'll continue to do that work. Um, the hotline that we also have available, in addition to the ONA Hotline, the Action NYC team, has access to interpretation services in up to 200 languages, as do our legal service providers. Uh, so we are always uh, you know, wanting to hear, are we 
missing something? Do we need to translate into another language? Do we need to provide uh, kind of interpretation or workshops in a different language and, and doing that? We're working currently with community-based providers on uh, New York Rights curriculum that includes this, and so um, for that, we also provide uh, translation and interpretation services. And are there any concerns that the proposed rule change could lead to fewer applicants for Section 8 vouchers? You know, I think readily in our, the, the analysis that we're doing now is gonna look deeper at this. Our concern is it could, yeah, you know, just understanding and recognizing what we've heard anecdotally and, and what we've engaged in in community conversations with individuals on that confusion. People who are themselves legal permanent residents and don't recognize, or don't know, rather, that this does not impact them and would not, will be asking that question. So it is imperative that sort of at every juncture in which they're going through their process, not just in interacting with us, but faith institutions and leaders and community-based providers, they're able to get access to good information. Because if that happened, it could exacerbate the already existing homelessness crisis that we have here in New York City. And then lastly, um, is the administration, as the administration is considering the broad ranging impact of the rule that you've discussed today, that all of you've discussed, uh, has there been any engagement with the governor's office or with state agencies uh, on how to work together as we sort through the potential impacts? Um, so the primary thing that we have done is uh, looking at how we can most effectively and efficiently triage uh, questions and be responsive to uh, issues as people raise them. That's the partnership that um, we have with the ONA hotline on the outreach and engagement work that we're doing here, um, letting people know that if, if what you need is just kind of basic information, this is kind of where you can go. If you need individualized legal support, you can come to us. The hotlines are uh, work together um, and triage in that way, uh, and it's a way for us all to be more effective and efficient in ensuring that we're reaching the broadest um, cross-section of New Yorkers in an effective way. Um, we have always and will continue to be always open to engaging in conversations around uh, utilization of benefits um, as we have in the past around DACA and TPS if, if a rule were to go into effect. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you uh, again to uh, Chairman Chaka, to, to Chair Levine, and to Chair Levin, uh, and also the public and advocates who are here today to talk about this and to inform our thoughts and discussions on how to be most supportive of the administration and all of you and the uh, folks that you all serve. I really appreciate uh, all the work you've done so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for, for being here. and. Uh, the, the, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chair Mark Levine on health, uh, but before that, I just want to get two clarifications. You spoke, um, we, the speaker asked about the relationship with the state right now. Has, has the mayor made a call to the governor himself about public charge and to really kind of create a, a line of connection and communication? Has, has, that, has that happened at that level of the mayor? I am not aware. Okay. Uh, it'd be great to see if there's anybody in InterGov here that can, I just want to make sure that, that that's, that's happening. Uh, and the second piece is really just kind of getting a clarification about the agencies that you're working with, all the agencies that you're working yeah. with right now. Can you just list them up right now? You, you mentioned that there's an agency task force mm -hmm. or group. We just want to get a list of all those agencies that are going to have impacted populations. So the list is long. Um, I will give We're you, ready. We're ready. <laughs> I'll give you top line. So um, some of the core, and I should say it includes um, our uh, counterparts at City Hall as well that join the, t the task force and the coordination calls. Um, it is, of course, uh, DSS, Department of Health, um, Health and Hospitals, ACS. Um, we have included uh, at different levels um, DIFTA, the Department of Probation, um, 
Oh, goodness. You're, you're really jogging my memory on everybody that joins these calls. Um, those are probably the core agencies um, that are a part of and informing a direct impact because of their service delivery um, and because of the uh, clients, if you will, that they have that are coming through, through them. And did I miss anybody that you guys? OK, great. So like NYCHA, HPD. Sorry, yes, HPD is a part of the conversation. Okay. NYCHA is a part of the conversation, yes. OK, but not NYCHA. Yeah, NYCHA has been a part of um, the broader agency group that's been receiving information and materials, okay. um, but HPD joins the, the calls. OK. Uh, yeah. Chair Levine. Thank you so much, Chairman Chaka. And that, that last question you asked is so critical. and. Just to put it delicately, if there's ever an area where we need the state and the city working together, it's this, because all of these benefits are just a tangle of city and state and federal funding, and almost any solution we can think of that would blunt the impact is going to require total coordination. I'm sure you know this, but important to emphasize. You alluded to one of the most really, uh, I would say, mor morally bankrupt components of this proposal, which is the notion that someone with a pre-existing health condition who is not even consuming any publicly subsidized benefit today, so they're not on Medicaid, they're, they're self-paying or not insured, but simply the presence of a pre-existing medical condition would actually prejudice their uh, renewal of, of permanent residency. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, the the Public charge rule has historically had this sort of totality of the circumstances analysis as a part of it. But what this rule does that goes further, that is, as you noted, one of the most dangerous parts of it, is uh, really hones in on the way that each individual factor, like a pre-existing health condition, would negatively affect that determination of future likelihood of being a public charge. So you, you would be asked to present your medical history as part of the immigration interview? Um, you know, that's a great question and one that I think we can't give you a definitive answer to. So much of the way that this will take effect is the training that, that USCIS officers will receive, the guidance that they'll receive at, at the highest levels on what they're supposed to ask for or look for. But these are the factors that they're supposed to take into consideration so they could readily request uh, that information. It's, it's really, it's chilling to think that the government is going to be rever reviewing the health records and uh, forcing people essentially to leave the country if, uh, if they have some condition deemed to be, uh, deemed to make them unworthy. I don't think we've focused on that but that's not the kind of country that I want to live in, and I think virtually every New Yorker would agree with that. Are, do you have some clarification on this point? No, I think what I said was accurate. They just want me to emphasize that somebody who's a green card holder and applying for renewal of that green card would not be subject to this. This would be for first-time applicants. Yes. Uh, no less morally bankrupt, no in less my morally opinion. Bankrupt, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you totally accurate. agree. Yes. Um, you referenced uh, that 311 now uh, is set up to receive questions from people who are concerned or scared or confused about this rule change. And you, you said that the co -word, code word, I think, was Action NYC, which I can't imagine most people would know. Probably they would say public charge. So if I call and say, I'm scared about the public charge rules, are the operators then trained yes. to respond to that? Yes. So um, 311 has sort of uh, two, two to three different paths. One is just public charge or benefits utilization, and the other is Action NYC if, if you're directly asking for legal services. So yes, they can be directed. I will say, and I think this is a credit to hopefully us, to you all, and to others, that what we're, where we're seeing the highest volume of calls is actually to our Action NYC hotline directly. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with 
existing, you know, work we did around outreach and engagement in advance of public charge and have continued to do as an administration so that people, we actually saw spikes the day that the proposal was announced, so people kind of readily knew where to call to get information. And we've continued to see some spikes as the proposal went into effect and more news, um, sorry, was published, not went into effect, and more news was generated. So. Uh, Many New Yorkers are finding their ways in the right ways, but we have corrected multiple sort of paths to ensure that nobody's kind of lost right, in the but, system. So just to clarify, so the operators on 311 are mostly referring to the hotline where people have all the training and expertise. That's right. Is that right? Okay. That's right. And that, the call just flips over right to yep. the hotline? Okay, great. Um, Administrator Bonilla, I think that's how we refer, we don't call you Commissioner Bonilla? No, that's right. Administrator's fine. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, you all have talked a lot about training um, community partners uh, to help allay fears and dispel rumors and, and just get the facts to New Yorkers. But we also have government workers who, who in, in HRA, a New Yorker could come in and say, I want to unenroll from a certain benefit. Sure. Are your staff now trained to say, hold on a minute, let's explain to you what the real threat is, and perhaps in that moment uh, ease their fears so they don't unenroll? So what we did as soon as the, uh, the a draft of the rule uh, came out was communicate with our frontline staff that nothing has changed, uh, that they really needed to emphasize that every New Yorker has a right to apply and go through the process of whether they're eligible or not. Uh, knowing that we would have some a portion of our clients walk in with that fear, what we have said to our staff is to make sure they have the flyer available if someone is asking questions about whether or not their eligibility is going to affect their immigration status. As you can imagine, this is complicated enough, and the last thing that we want is to have HRI frontline staff parse out whether someone will be affected or not. Uh, so what we hold true to is everyone has a right to apply, everyone has a right to access these benefits, and if there's any question by anyone that walks in our doors, they also have the right to access the services that we have put so much money into to make sure that they get the right information. Very good. Um, I mentioned before the, the tangle of funding streams now that supports almost every benefit you can imagine, and uh, that makes information sharing a challenge. Now, at, at the moment, as we're assessing the threat, it's important that city, state, and even federal officials, the feds are probably not going to partner with us on this, um, can help to identify the scale of the threat, and I think you've done some of that. If the worst comes to pass and this rule change is implemented, then I'm not sure how I feel about information sharing because I wouldn't want the immigration interviewer uh, perhaps to know uh, every benefit that the person they're interviewing is, is receiving. Um, how is it that, that a benefit that the state is providing would come to the attention of an immigration agent? I can speak to that, um, top lines. So the, the primary thing is that when you're going through the immigration process and you're applying to become a legal permanent resident, you're asked this question on your application subject to penalty of perjury. Self-reported, right? Yes. Um, and so I, I think that's the, the primary sort of initial affirmative way that people get that information. You also submit a medical exam as part of that process. Um, and the, you know, again, the underlying sort of factors and how the officers will be um, guided towards looking beyond the, the scope of the application is something that, that training w and policy memoranda that USCIS will issue will tell us. Um, that, is, that remains sort of a question mark of how, how far beyond the scope of the application itself that they will, they will go. But it, at this time, um, as far as we know, that there, is, there isn't that. It's self-reported. Okay. Um. Dr. Angel, uh, DOHMH has very sophisticated surveillance of, of countless health measures. Do you know yet whether we're seeing any reduction of, of doctor's visits um, by New Yorkers who are um, fearful of this change, and whether we're seeing any 
uh, spikes in uh, any of the health conditions that you're monitoring, such as TB, um, that might be attributable to um, New Yorkers being reluctant to seek medical care? Yeah, we, um, uh, reflecting what was just said, we've been very proactive in training all of our frontline staff to reassure people if they raise concerns that nothing has changed, that we continue to provide services regardless of immigration status. Because the services we provide don't require asking about immigration status, we don't collect numbers on specific people who may not be seeking services or right, who Right, but have we, we certainly hear anecdotal reports that, that FQHCs, for example, are experiencing a reluctance of immigrant patients to come in for care. No, I fully appreciate that. Just, just reaffirming, too, that, that we are trying to make sure very clearly that the messaging that we have across all of our agencies is um, consistent and does not confuse the individu individuals that are seeking care. Um, I don't have numbers for you now specifically about whether there are uh, vast increases or decreases. We do have this antidote, an anecdotal um, understanding of people responding and saying yes, uh, uh, expressing some fear, and then us pr providing information back. Um, we are looking at those numbers, though, and we can get back to you as they uh, I, I, I keep mentioning TB because yeah. it's, it's a disease that almost exclusively affects immigrants and one which, uh, if not treated or diagnosed and treated, um, is highly contagious. Uh, we know that in, in the last year in which we had data, there was uh, a reversal in the long-term decline in TB, and uh, I think there was a 10% increase. That's correct. Do you have more recent data? Have we continued to see an increase in TB cases in the city? So the numbers that you're referring to was com uh, comparing 2016 to 2017, and you're absolutely correct. We had about a 10% increase. Uh, the proportion of people with TB uh, are about 86% of the total who are immigrants. So indeed, you're correct that the, the burden of TB in our population is carried by immigrants, and th that makes uh, seeking and making those services available to that population absolutely critical. Um, and so we continue to provide those services. I don't have specific numbers in um, uh, an immediate change in the number of people seeking care for those services at this time, or uh, it spikes or numbers related to this immediate time at this moment. Um, we continue and we'll, we can uh, return to you with numbers. Um, but the, the most important message that we continue to get out to not only the community but to physicians and other frontline individuals is that those services are avail available regardless of immigration right. status. That should never stop somebody from seeking care for this. And, and I, I, I want to emphasize what I said in my opening statement that um, public health is everybody's problem and no one is immune from uh, deadly microbes and uh, it, 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 people who are callous and say that because they're, they have citizenship or they have no concerns with public charge are, um, are not just amoral, they're also potentially putting themselves and their own families in danger. So uh, I mean, public health requires collective action for that reason. Um, I know that I don't think a health and hospitals representative is here, and I don't know to the extent you're able to speak on behalf of uh, what could be called a sister agency, mm -hmm. but uh, if, if New Yorkers in the thousands lose health coverage and cease going to their neighborhood clinic for their annual checkups and their vaccinations, um, they're going sh to start showing up in H&H &H emergency rooms when they're in medical crisis. Uh, do you know the extent to which H&H &H, um, has begun to uh, prepare for this potential crisis uh, to help mitigate the damage and to have adequate resources ready to deal with it? I can't speak on behalf of what H&H's specific actions are. Um, similar to all of us throughout this messaging, though, the, care, the services that we're providing are uh, there regardless of immigration status or ability to pay. Okay, so, so uh, m my fellow chairs, I think we should try and follow up with H&H &H, uh, because they're going to be on the front lines. Can I, uh, can I add to that? Yes. Uh, I'll add on two notes. Um, one, in um, the funding cycle last year, um, many of us, the Department of Health and others collectively were advocated to ensure that there wasn't a cut in funding towards TB outreach. 
and services, and we're successful at doing that. I think that's something that continues to be on our radar and, and to look out for to ensure that we are continuing to see commitments towards ensuring that the communities that need that information and service are receiving it. So um, look forward to working with you on that. Um, and I think in terms of H&H, H&H has been readily engaged at every step of this with all of us. They are also, um, as I said, have given directive to their staff. They are looking at this closely, running their own sort of monitoring and evaluation of impact and have been deeply committed um, at the, the highest level with Dr. Katz at emphasizing repeatedly that, that nothing about the way that h, &H delivers uh, services changes and that people both emergency and regular health care should freely come and receive those services at h, &H locations. We're continuing to look at ways that we can ensure communities have access and know that, and that's something that we, as, as a part of the work that we are readily doing, but that commitment is there and an ongoing work. No, well, Dr. Katz has been a very strong leader for the system, and his commitment is second to none. It's just a question of resources. We want to make sure he has the resources. Yeah. I also want to mention that um, uh, City, city uh, subsidized benefits are not, you've, you've made this clear, are not part of the calculus. And that does open an opportunity for us. Um, yes, there's a cost, but um, one that, that I would argue is, is a good investment. Um, we had a wonderful pilot um, about two years ago through the health department's leadership, and, and Moya was very involved, Action Health NYC, mm -hmm. that using, um, no, no federal money, this happened to be philanthropically supported, um, gave undocumented immigrants a primary care home to get their annual visits, to get their checkups and, and preventative care. Um, in a world in which even fewer immigrants in New York City can access Medicaid and Medicare, et cetera, mm -hmm. then the need for some form of city subsidized backstop that at least gives people a primary care home is greater than ever. Uh, I know that, that Chairman Chaka cares a lot about this as well. Have, have we thought about revisiting, um, bringing back Action Health as a permanent program in light of what could be a more desperate need than ever? Yeah, you're speaking to the very important uh uh, the relevance of primary care and access to primary care services as a conduit then to get specialty care and all of the benefits that come from being able to take care of your own health, the impact on yourself, on your family, and on your community at large. And we share absolutely with you the sense that this is a right and that it's very important that we make those services readily available. So Action Health NYC was a one-year demonstration project, and from it we did learn a lot about the impact that can have, including that it increases, for example, um, the likelihood that an individual will have a primary care home and be able to get those important services. Um, from that, we those lessons learned uh, are things that H&H &H has also, as a partner in Action Health NYC, may also just note that um, including Moya and, and DOH and, uh, MH and our community federally qualified health centers as well as H&H &H were all a part of this demonstration project. And that information is information that H&H &H has and is um, using as they um, think forward with their services. Um, and, and so as we move forward, we really need to make sure that this, this population does have great access to care. Okay, well, we're gonna continue to push to bring that program back on a permanent basis. Thank you, and thank yes. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Levine. Chair Levin. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. I want to thank you all for your testimony. And so I'll, I'll try to keep this um, as brief as I can, because uh, I know that uh, it's, you've been testifying for a couple hours here, so I, I appreciate uh, your time. Um, not quite a couple hours just yet, but. <laughs> um, uh, following up on, on Council Member Levine's uh, last couple questions, when when we refer to public charge, then that that specifically refers to federal benefits or better it's, uh, benefits paid with with federal dollars. So, uh, a purely CTL city tax levy or state funded uh, tax funded um, uh, program would would not would not be prohibited. Or is that or am I wrong on that? I mean. Did, does is that the definition of public, or does public include all public dollars? So the definition is just what's deline delineated in currently as the cash assistance and long-term institutional care 
and in a proposal as the ones that are articulated. Yeah. So SNAP, uh, non-emergency Medicaid, Section 8 and subsidized housing, um, and uh, Medicare Part D. So then it wouldn't be interpreted then or it couldn't be interpreted by a, a case officer um, to include an, you know, any other benefit if we were to figure out some way in the long term to circumvent that? As the proposal is stated, that's correct. The benefits that they're going to look at are the ones that are specifically delineated. Um, let's see. Uh, I might skip around a little bit, and I apologize for that in advance. Um, has our uh, data analytics team um, I, um, been able to, to uh, look at identifying where there are drop-offs in particular benefits, for example, WIC or SNAP benefits, and whether we uh, can do proactive outreach, outreach to those households, a letter, a phone call, an email, um, to say, we understand, we, we see that you have, uh, you know, for inexplicable reasons, uh, 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 disenrolled or unenrolled from your benefits, um, Here's what you need to know about, you know, whether if this was if this was due to a you know concern around public charge, um, uh, and immigration status. Here's what you need to know. Is there any way to do that type of analytics and and do that kind of proactive outreach instead of? I mean, I know it's if obviously it's incredibly important to be able to receive calls, but but to do proactive outreach as well. Um, so thanks for the question. So a, a couple of things. Um, the the way that we've sort of looked at understanding the impact, we have, I think, bear in mind that it's just been one month since the proposed rule has been published in the Federal Register, so it's slightly premature for us to have um, a much grander sort of understanding of disenrollment or that we would see dramatic numbers or changes. We haven't. I'll, I'll allow uh, Administrator Bonilla to speak more to that. Um, what we have been doing and are, are doing even further is um, using the, the data that we do have available, our own methodology, and kind of going deeper and understanding what real impact would look like. That doesn't give you the particular household because, again, it's slightly premature for that. We're at a we're just a month shy into the the proposal even being published. So um, I think the, the administrator can speak to what they're seeing in terms of kind of enrollment on SNAP broadly. Sure, so on SNAP, um, it's important to note that we are constantly reaching out to, to cohorts of communities that we think are eligible regardless of other immigration st status, right? And I believe this council has also funded programs to reach out to the elderly or reach out to uh, underserved communities. So that work continues regardless of whether there's a public charge rule or not. What I can say is that the trends that we've seen, and we monitor our data pretty closely, uh, do not show an impact because of the public charge rule on our staff enrollment. Um, again, I agree with the commissioner, it's really too early to tell, yeah. uh, but so far we have not seen an impact. Is there a potential that if you were to see something that you know you see as a correlation that you could do proactive outreach, or is the, on, on particularly on people that are disenrolling, not, not just people that are eligible that haven't enrolled before, but sure. people that are dropping off? So the reality is that we don't know why people may disenroll, right? Our, our caseloads are complicated. Right. Uh, what we they do go. know is, yep, right. what we do know is that the economy definitely has an impact. Uh, do we have the capacity to outreach? We definitely have the infrastructure to outreach. We would need further analysis uh, to do outreach on this particular issue. Okay. Um, jumping back here, just to the big picture, can you provide a um, kind of a, a, a big picture context to how this proposed rule fits into the long-term narrative of, of public charge as it relates to immigration law. So you said in your testimony, the, uh, the speaker mentioned that you know, public charge has been an element of immigration law for 100 years. However, I think we all agree that this is a major departure. This is a radical, this is a radical shift in policy from any administration, Democrat, Republican, progressive, conservative, um, you know, 
Reagan administration, Obama administration. We haven't seen um, this type of action before. So could you maybe put that into some kind of context? What is this, like how, how far outside of the, um, uh, the, 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 the kind of societal norms that we, and governmental norms that we've been working under for a century, how far outside of that uh, uh, framework or paradigm are we with this proposed rule? Sure, I maybe won't go back a century. I mean, we can talk about sort of the history of immigration more broadly and how at different junctures it has been focused on exclusion um, and public charge has been a part of that narrative. Um, so that's true. I think what, we're, what you're referring to really is the more recent history and regardless of kind of party in terms of what we've looked at on public charge. And um, as I noted in my testimony, the most recent shift we saw was in the 90s. Um, and in the 90s, um, when, in response to massive immigration reform that, that was uh, uh, in many ways more limiting in terms of immigration, as well as um, welfare reform, there was a uh, concern, rampant confusion amongst immigrant communities and families that the public charge uh, analysis would be negative uh, towards them and that there is some public record um, and analysis of health impacts at that time and people choosing to even disenroll their U.S. citizen children from receipt of Medicaid and other health services because of the fear uh, that was generated by those reforms and by uh, the administra administration's application of the rule. Um, as, as a direct response to that, uh, the Attorney General at the time issued guidance that narrowed and limited the application of public charge to what is current day's application, which is that simply the cash assistance mm -hmm. and long-term institutional care with the ability to bring in an affidavit of support to overcome some of your, um, some of the potential future challenges. This is during the Clinton administration? Correct. Yeah. So since then, th that has been the standard application with no shift regardless of Republican or Democratic administration. There's been no attempt to shift, so the George W. Bush administration didn't attempt to shift public charge or there was no rumblings of that at that during that administration? I think that's right and I think what's what's not notable here is you know this this federal administration as everybody has rightly noted has taken a largely xenophobic approach towards immigration more broadly removing from the mission statement of the US Citizenship and Immigration Services the words nation of all immigrants and that is you know, a direct historical erasure of the reality of what plays out in our countries. And while, uh, you know, one can debate the application of public charge period in immigration law, I think the reality is that the reason you haven't gone more stringent, the reason you haven't seen a more draconian application like we are today is myriad. One, it's because there was a recognition in the late 90s that doing that can lead to public health crises, can lead to people who should not uh, and would not be impacted choosing to disenroll from programs that we want them to be enrolled in for the public health and safety of not just those individuals and their families, though that's the right thing to do, but of us as a society as a whole. Um, and on top of that, you know, we know that that you know we we and should take pride in the fact that we do work to engage residents that are eligible to for benefits to enroll in those benefits. That is something that we believe we ought to be doing. And we know that immigrants are not readily accessing benefits at greater length rates than native born Americans. We know that in fact uh, new, newer immigrants to our country might uh, access benefits to get on their feet, but that second generation immigrants actually contribute more economically in return to our country than native born uh, uh, children. So, you know, the, the sort of history and understanding of uh, why you wouldn't choose to do such a draconian application of public charge in the immigration context. Uh, really speaks to why you haven't seen a shift uh, across administrations and that this is, a, is a, a significant departure from common sense and rationale around what you, would do, why, what you would do here. And bipartisan policy for at least the last 20 years. Yep. 
Um, do we, are we, have we, have you reached out to um, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs to see if this would also be impacting uh, veterans? Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs has been engaged in, in our conversations. Um, and obviously, um, what's noteworthy, of course, again here, is this does not impact legal permanent residents. It does not impact individuals that are seeking to renew that residence or apply for citizenship. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've just wanted to ensure that, that people know that it doesn't impact them, that, that the department itself is able to share out that information uh, with folks that they work for um, and with, uh, but we have engaged them in this conversation. Um, it was asked by the speaker, but do we have a sense of how many current public housing New York City NYCHA residents might be affected by this? Um, it's again worth noting here that if, if you are not uh, you know, already having stabilized immigration status, you're not eligible um, largely for Section 8 and other housing. So um, what we're mostly concerned in those contexts with is that broader chilling effect and ensuring that and people have good information and knowing that they're not going to be impacted by this rule. Okay, so we don't, we don't have a sense though of current, those current living in, currently living in public housing of how many would be affected if the rule were to go into effect? So, so what I'm noting is that, in fact, the, those who are eligible for those benefits are not the ones that would be readily impacted by this rule. Oh, I rule. see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, have we uh, reached out to, uh, to our New York City congressional delegation um, to see what um, you know, the incoming Democratic House um, what measures they can take, or are there, I mean, just for, on the mechanics of this, this is a, a, a proposed rule, what role does Congress have uh, in this process, uh, or does it have any role whatsoever? So notably, one of the reasons, um, probably the primary reason, that even the proposed rule lays out a series of individuals who are exempted from um, a rule should it go into effect like asylees and refugees and VAWA recipients and so forth is because that's the, the executive cannot change that. That's stat by statute. And so um, I think that speaks to the ability for Congress uh, to be able to um, take a different point of view here and to regulate um, uh, beyond what they already have in this area to prevent something like this from going into effect. We've been committed um, in ensuring that not just us as a city, but cities across the country are able to advocate effectively on this um, and doing regular uh, kind of conversations and a training that we did last May with our cities across the country. We've engaged um, on many issues that have impacted our communities with, um, with our congressional uh, delegation, including a briefing on public charge that we did. Um, so we will remain in conversation and committed to uh, raising this, and certainly there is a role for Congress to play here. Have you gotten any feedback from members of the congressional delegation of actions that they are contemplating taking? Um, not at this time. Okay. But that's something that we can follow up with, particularly after January. Yes. Okay, please keep us informed of anything that we can do to continue that advocacy um, working with our, um, uh, our congressional delegations. And then um, if, uh, sorry, question about family members. Uh, one of the prior panelists mentioned that um, people are concerned that if they are receiving benefits uh, they won't be able to uh, help additional family members, you know, that they may be prevented from helping additional family members uh, uh, come to the United States. Is that something that, uh, that you're seeing? Is that a concern? Is that something that, uh, how, we, how would we appro you know, appropriately deal with that? I just want to make sure I understood the, cor the question correctly, that they would be concerned that they couldn't bring additional families? I think that's what we heard from the prior panel. Yeah, so um, it's important to note that the 
uh, public charge rule application applies differently for those who are currently in the United States and those who are entering the United States from abroad. Um, the actual application through the consular, sir, consular offices um, it has already changed under this administration. Um, they already have broader guidance on looking at uh, the totality, if you will, of circumstances and looking at those individualized factors. It is not um, written nor as draconian as what was proposed here for um, application administration from inside the United States. But if anybody is looking to apply for a family member abroad, um, we recommend that they immediately um, speak to a trusted immigration legal service provider and ensure that they have good information and are able to make the right decisions for themselves and their, their families. Um, this question is for Administrator Bonilla. Um, are, are we examining whether this would impact people that are currently homeless residing in the New York City shelter system uh, in terms of whether they may be eligible then to receive um, housing assistance uh, that um, has be, you know that we've been relying on to uh, help people move out of the shelter system, so vouchers that draw down on on uh, federal dollars. So to emphasize what uh, the commissioner has said, uh, we are really looking at the plain language of the rule, and nothing in the rule points to that being an issue. Okay. Uh, we th the last thing we want to do is give uh, any further ideas to the federal government. So we are responding to what is in the proposed rule. The rule does not, the rule makes reference to housing. It makes a specific reference, I believe, to section eight. Uh, it does not make a reference to a larger housing, uh, to my knowledge. Okay, it says section eight and, and rental assistance, and rental. but is that, is that? Uh, so we are interpreting that as federal rental assistance. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, I guess my last question, and then I'll turn it back to uh, Chairman Chaka. Um, is, is, the, is it possible that if this were to come to pass, I mean, trying to examine different creative ways that the city could um, ensure that people are maintaining, that people aren't disenrolling from benefits, um, is it is it a possibility that the city could assume financial sponsor of of um, of people in, in order to um, uh, when they're applying or reapplying for um, permanent resident status? Is that something that has been examined, or is that a, 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 an option in the future? Um, so the the current process, as it stands. Um, provides for an, an individual applicant to be able to submit what's called an affidavit of support from a family member, a friend, or um, somebody who's willing to support them in that process. Uh, so that, that exists and that's largely what individuals can use to overcome a negative uh, consideration on public charge. What the plain language, though, of this proposal seems to articulate is that that affidavit of support in and of itself would not be enough to overcome the receipt of one of those benefits so, that was outlined. So um, I think that answers your so that question. Is a, that's an, also a radical departure from, from status quo. That's right? correct. Um, now has there ever, I'm just, Curious, has there ever been, uh, has it ever been examined whether institutions can play that role and not individuals, family members, and so, uh, so on? I In other words, has a foundation ever submitted an affidavit of support? I don't immediately readily have the answer to that. I know by way of practice um, that uh, the individual that's um, providing that affidavit of support process is essentially entering into a contract with the um, individual applicant, right, saying that mm -hmm. I will be responsible for this individual and they're required to provide their own income taxes and um, so forth in that, and income and assets in that process. Um, I've never uh, utilized an, a non-individual uh, actor. I don't know if the, if the regulation or statute imagines that. I'm sure some of the legal service providers in the room might know, but we're happy to get back to you. Okay, because um, the city could, 
I mean, it's obviously the 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 the, the benefit that we that we receive in um, you know economic activity um, for the overall economy. It's 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 I think worth, and we should examine uh, what that impact would be of, of of putting up therefore city tax levy dollars in order to supplant those federal dollars in those ways. Um, and then just uh, I'm sorry, one last question. Just um, you made reference in your testimony, but, but just to speak a little bit more about um, the the change in the um, in the uh, in the in the overall determination of people's um, uh, uh, whether somebody would be um, uh, seen as self-sufficient. So there's the part of this action is or this proposed rule um, significantly alters. Um, the, the people's, how it's determined whether the, the likelihood of somebody potentially becoming a public charge. And so um, that is, that's proposed to be shifted significantly. Can you speak a little bit more about what that would mean? Who might get, um, who might get drawn into um, now being uh, seen as disqualified just based on things like education status or age or health status? Um, things that we, uh, as a society, uh, I think you would find, you know, a very large majority of Americans um, uh, would, 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 I think, abhor um, uh, you know, factoring in somebody's pre-existing condition, if you will, mm -hmm. on uh, on a health status, on whether or not they could um, uh, uh, be a permanent resident here. Sure. So to reiterate, the um, one aspect of the proposed rule uh, builds on a determination around a totality of an individual's circumstances. It takes into consideration um, individual factors like health, age, uh, income, education, and so forth, and employment history, and so forth. So um, the the radical departure here is that it is not this totality of the circumstances test. These individual factors are looked at um, separately. Some are, are uh, weighted more heavily than others, including that you're under the age of 16 or over the age of 60 could readily be used against you. Your income level might be a determinate, determinative factor in and of itself, a pre-existing condition and so forth. So. Um, that is very different than what it, what currently happens, and it is one of the areas where the the letter of the proposed rule is unclear in terms of what actually will happen once something gets um, if something ever gets finalized, and what the instruction will be to individual immigration officers and how they are to proceed uh, in the application of that part of this proposal and. Um, I think as we, in the back and forth with Council Member Levine that we had, one thing that I didn't know that is notable is that USCIS has an investigative arm. Um, so, you know, if they think that maybe you're not disclosing something accurately, could they use investigators as something we don't, we don't know in terms of what they'll do here? Okay. I mean, I think just, I, I think this, this hearing is important because I think that I'm not sure if this is the first hearing, public hearing on this issue in any municipality in the country, but um, I think that it is vitally important that Americans across this country understand how radical this is um, uh, and how uh, truly disturbing this is um, and that it's uh, seemingly small things like this that are, frankly, the departure points towards fascistic governmental uh, actions and governmental uh, frameworks. And so um, this is, this is uh, it hasn't gotten a tremendous amount of attention, um, but um, just so everybody understands, what we're saying here is that if this potentially could mean that just by the virtue of you being under the age of 16 or over the age of 60 or having a certain education level or a certain employment history or a pre-existing condition health-wise 
could mean that you, based on those measures individually, it could be determinative in rejecting an application for permanent immigration status in this country. And I think that that is amazingly disturbing. And I want to make sure that we all understand, the public understands, this is what's at stake here. So I want to thank you so much for all the work you continue to do. You have a partner here in this council, and we look forward to working with you to make sure that this rule never gets implemented. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair Levin, and I, I want to continue that thought, uh, make a quick remark, and then hand it over to Councilmember Miller for some questions, and then I'm going to end with some questions as well. Um, but that, that, the nature of this, of this is not only real, but it points to the deportation machine that is already in full effect and has been impacting our needs on the legal side. And so this is not just about an application getting rejected, this is also about an application getting rejected, someone falling out of status, and then being ready for deportation. And so I have no, I, I truly believe this is, this is um, we, are, we are David and Goliath in, in so many ways. We're gonna do everything we can, which is why I'm gonna remind everyone, before you leave, if you are planning to testify, and it's already late, I know, um, and are leaving, please do not hesitate to stop uh, and fill out your testimony, especially if there's a story here that you want to uh, emphasize. Uh, and so the, 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 uh, the team is back there to, the, uh, to my right. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Chair Manchaka. And let me say to your co-chairs, uh, thank you for collaborating on such a, an important and, and, and thoughtful uh, concern of all of ours and um, to the administration, thank you for the work that you're doing in, in advance. So um, in completion of your data reports, and, and I know it's still under review, ha have we identified certain target uh, communities? Uh, and, and if so, uh, or, or, or uh, an uptick in certain communities, and if so, how have we addressed that and, and what agencies have been charged and or uh, CBOs that, that, that are doing the work and how can members and communities support that effort? Um, so I wouldn't say that we have identified anything, any, any community in particular on public charge specifically, but a, as a part of what we do generally is looking at and understanding what communities are accessing um, services who, who aren't, um, where we have providers that are able to, um, in communities, uh, provide services and where we don't. That's a part of what we generally do. Much of the outreach work that we focus on is engaging communities that have had less access um, to services, and so that's something that we're continuing to do, in particular around uh, where we will be um, focusing on making sure we can provide Know Your Rights workshops, where we'll be in schools in terms of um, larger uh, uh, student body populations that, that and their parents who might not readily have access to things. I think that's a great idea. In fact, it's, uh, you know, just in general, know your rights and immigration services. That's a, that's a great starting point in what we yeah. do on, on a pretty regular, and I think it should be expanded in this point. I know we talked about, it, it was also discussed um, uh, whether the, the sharing of, of benefit information and applications with city, state, and federal government, if that happens, and, and, and if so, what is the impact that that uh, what are the unintended consequences of that? Sure, I'll start top lines and then ask uh, my colleagues to jump in. But top lines, the city has very strong um, and broad confidentiality policies um, in, in partnership with the council expanded upon last year and, and um, legislated. And so we, my office works very closely with um, the city's uh, chief privacy officer, who works with general counsels across all agencies to ensure that they have robust privacy and confidentiality policies and not just somebody's immigration status, but more broadly information on all New Yorkers is uh, protected to the maximum extent possible under the law. But in terms of specific benefits administration, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. 
Well, generally, on, on the public benefits front, uh, we have very, very tight confidentiality uh, laws, um, mainly administered by the state, but also locally. So it would be very difficult to get to some of our information. Okay, great. And then, and then finally, I, I know it was question was asked uh, a few times about NYCHA and, and, and how those who were who would qualify for, for housing benefits that generally would not be at risk here. Um, but have we identified extended family in those housing situations? Because we all have those relatives that we take in and, and, and certainly, um, uh, you know, and, and they're attempting to access benefits as well. Have we looked at that and, you know, how do we reach that audience? Um, I would reiterate that the the proposed rule does not um, provide that if uh, somebody in your household, for example, were to receive that benefit, that that would be used against you. So for us, the number one thing here is to make sure that all of the residents know that there wouldn't be an impact on, there isn't an impact on them now, and there wasn't likely to be an impact on them if there were to be a final rule. Thank you, and uh, thank you to our chairs again. Once again, very thoughtful and, and necessary here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. And we were joined by Councilmember Yeager, Reynoso, Barron, uh, Councilmember Miller, and Joe Nye earlier today. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, 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 adds, ask some final questions about the analysis that was presented and the, the economic impact analysis that was provided in the press release and that you re-mentioned in your testimony. And really just let, letting the folks know at home that you are, uh, in, well actually, how are you arriving to those and this is a simulation that you are, can you just walk through what a simulation is how, you're, how you have arrived at the economic impact uh, and thinking about the health costs, ho uh, homeless and hunger factors, and how they, they kind of separate uh, into individual uh, areas of need? Um, sure, so our preliminary analysis in partnership with the Office of Economic Opportunity and the Department of Social Services looked at a couple of different things. One, we modeled using census data um, the number of New Yorkers who could and could immediately directly be impacted um, by the rule, rule, and by that I don't mean that the rule is in effect, but that there are individuals who are currently eligible for a benefit um, who have not yet become legal permanent residents. Um, that's about 75,000, um, and so we overlaid um, individuals el currently eligible for the benefit that have not yet become a legal permanent resident um, and that had uh, lower income rates and were enrolled in one of the articulated benefits. So that's 75,000. That 400,000 additional number speaks to number of New Yorkers who are here who are not eligible for benefits but who might meet one of those factors um, that are articulated in, in the test. So might have a lower income, um, might have a health condition, so forth. Um, we additionally looked at um, in data from the state um, that was provided on uh, current enrollment in um, some benefits, including SNAP, um, that DSS looked, le looked at. And in that data, um, what was available was the number of non-citizens that are currently enrolled in those programs. Um, and um, that was about 220,000 uh, or so, I believe, non-citizens. And so the reason that we did that was, again, not because all of those individuals would be impacted by uh, the proposed rule if it were to be final, but because we know, based on anecdote, historical record, conversations with providers and communities, that that chilling effect on individuals who are non-citizens is something that's of great concern to us. Um, and so that number um, speaks to the individuals who could themselves believe that they would be impacted and choose to disenroll. Thank you, that's really important to kind of understand the, 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 the nuance yes. to that. And really we wanna just 
let everyone know, and this is a question that I think I know the answer to, but I want to ask it because I want everyone to know that we're going to be working in partnership, but that, that you will continue to provide information and, and conversation connection to strategy as we work together to figure out what the speaker was pointing to, which is funding, funding for the administration to do education, to do outreach, to think about ways of creating universal access, just like our, our IDNYC program. And that's all going to have a budget impact, and we want to be able to be ready for that. Um, was, some of us are members of the BNT. We're ready to start thinking about this today as well, which is why I asked whether or not the mayor has called directly to, and if that question has been answered, I'd, we'd like to hear that, whether he's called the governor himself, uh, and whether that will tell us that this is a priority. Uh, and, and so, again, if that can come back to us right now, that'd be great. Uh, but this is why we, we're trying to understand the, the fuller need about what the possibilities are. Um, I will say that only four comments have been, uh, have been filled out in the back. So, and I know there are many more of you that have not yet filled it out. So please, while we're in conversation, I, I implore you, I will, I will give you the final tally of the folks that have, have sent their comments. It's really, really important that that, that happens. And then finally, we're gonna be in a very, in, in some ways I think we're there now, making a decision about how we communicate when the rule, whatever version of it, be it slimmed down even further or at its current draft, you will have to be making a choice as a city agency about how you communicate to people. And this is a choice between disenrolling or, um, or, or staying connected to services which is why we're putting so much emphasis on trying to figure out how we, how we create programs that are okay, that are funded by the city, that are funded by the state. And so are you preparing that moment? And I'm not asking you to make a decision now that that, that, that comes later after we figure out the proposal, but what's, what's the strategy today as you think about that moment that is gonna come within the next six to seven months? It's, 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 it's coming. Um, so I'll, I'll say a couple of things. One, I hope it never comes. I think that the focus, of course, is on, um, as we noted, pushing back, ensuring that we're not just kind of raising our voices now, um, but through the comment process and thereafter in uh, advocacy and activating other stakeholders and using all the tools at our disposal to prevent um, something like this from ever going into effect. Um, I think what you articulated in terms of a timeline is the earliest possible really imagined timeline. I would note again as much as and frequently as often this is not a final rule. Even if there were to be a final rule, there's a 60-day grace period articulated in the proposal that would have to take place before the rule would become effective. So it's so important that um, we not preempt that process. You know, we have been engaged for over a year, really, on what's the right top-line messaging for staff um, as people are coming in and. Um, I think feel some level of comfort in uh, the fact that we didn't arm staff with specificity of what the leak draft said, because what we saw in the proposal was so dramatically different than what the leak draft said, and we would have maybe needlessly um, contributed to that confusion and fear. Um, similarly, we don't know what a final rule might say, and so. I think we're, we're committed to ensuring that as people come through our agencies and interface with city um, outreach uh, workers and our offices, they're getting good information. They know that nothing has changed at this time. They know that we're committed to fighting against it and they know where they can go to get that individualized consultation from trusted legal service providers. Uh, so that is where we're, we're deeply committed. We are also committed to engaging in open lines of communication and conversations as we have with providers, with counsel, with others, um, to think through uh, what would be appropriate um, in looking at how to mitigate um, uh, that, that really impossible choice that somebody might have to make um, and what makes sense in terms of ensuring that our staff has messaging wise if there is a final rule in effect. Okay, again, I, 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 I hear your hope and in so many ways I am meeting that hope and I have hope every day 
for some things, and I think so much of that hope comes in, in ways that are uh, life-changing in our communities. When immigrants are voting in participatory budgeting, then they're still voting right now, uh, and, they're, and they're applying for IDNYC, and there's, there's hope in us that I have in this city, what I don't have hope for at all, and I do not want to bank this entire conversation around public charge, is that the federal government is in any way going to give us any leniency uh, at all. And so we need to be prepared for that. The 60-day window of opportunity that we're going to have when, when the soonest moment comes is not a lot of time. And that's going to require a lot of funding and, really, um, and resources that we need to be able to anticipate and plan for. And this is one of those things we cannot be tripping along the way. And I, I keep on hearing that this is just about hope that's not going to happen. We're going to do everything we can, no doubt. But in a very parallel kind of way, we need to be ready to figure out what we're going to do, what things need to shift, and, and get ready to plug in those deep gaps of funding that are going to be connected to food and housing and health care and the massive education campaign that is going to require a lot of funding and rethinking how we do things. So I'm, I'm sounding, an, we are sounding an alarm right now. And, and so I, I just hope that very quickly we can, we can, we can see some uh, focus on that as well. December 10th is coming, and we're going to do all our work to that. But December 11th, we're going to get down and say, here's the plan, this is what it's going to cost, and we're going to be ready to do that. And it's going to come from the governor and from the legislative body in, in Albany, and it's going to come from the city council and the mayor, and that we have our, that we have our immigrant communities back not just those technically uh, connected to this, but all the other people that are gonna get, are gonna get s swept up in this confusion and what is the whitening of this country through this immigration deportation machine that is Trump and his people. And I, that is just the absolute truth and I think all the advocates are gonna talk to that. So I'm gonna stop talking there and say thank you again for your partnership for both of you, uh, for all three of you, I should say, and for all the other agencies that are thinking about this, uh, but we're not gonna let up. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'm gonna bring up the next panel for discussion, and, and again, I, I'm gonna ask you to fill out your comment before you leave, uh, and encourage your friends and family to submit their comment. Comments have to be filled out in English as well, which is incredibly unfortunate, but we will do that, and if you need support, we have support in the back. Um, the next panel will be uh, Rose Duhan, Megalina Diaz from the Hunger Free America, Hannah Scott, Westside Campaign Against Hunger, the citywide organization fighting hunger and poverty and equality, uh, Jerome Nathaniel from City Harvest, Rachel Sabella, No Kid Goes Hungry, or No Kid Hungry and Why, Claudia Calhoun from the New York Immigration Coalition. Okay, and that's it. I think we're gonna have a full, full panel here. Uh, so I'm really hoping that we can, uh, we're gonna hear as many folks as possible, and I'm really happy that you were all here uh, listening to the commissioner and this dialogue. And I'm hoping that we can use your time here uh, and, and not necessarily read from the testimony, but really add to the conversation so that we can get through the panel, ask questions, and then make sure that we can get as many people as possible to, um, to testify. The clock will be at three minutes. And so watch the clock, please. Uh, and if you need to leave before uh, you can testify and you've prepared testimony, hand it over to the Sergeant of Arms. They will stamp it and we will take it and we will read it and we will analyze it. You heard the commitment is real. We wanna know what the need is and what it's gonna cost us to do the right thing here for our immigrant communities. Claudia, can you go first? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for convening this panel. Uh, or sorry, not just the panel, the entire hearing. Um, it, it's been a real pleasure to work with uh, Committee Chair Menchaca and Committee Chair Levin and Com Committee Chair Levine. So, so I really appreciate all of the talk about sort of the animus and malevolence of the federal administration. 
Um, I really appreciate all the technical details that have been shared about what's in the rule, what's not in the rule, what it means. Um, I really appreciate all of the, the, the discussion of the population health impacts. Um, one thing I would say about um, infectious disease is I'm, of course I'm concerned about infectious disease and, I'm sh and I, I, I think that's a really powerful frame, but I also am really concerned about chronic disease and the long-term, life-term effects not of New Yorkers in general, the long-term life effects on immigrants that, that, that suffer through food insecurity now or suffer through housing insecurity now or delay health care because, and so, I, so I, I think if we're gonna talk about public, the public health impacts of the rule, we always wanna talk about chronic disease and the public health impacts for the people that are living through this time and affected by the policy. Um, I think there's a real consensus in this room around the value of people being able to go to, children being able to go to school, you know, with a full meal, um, pregnant women being able to seek prenatal care. Um, the, the, the things that the council can do, I think, I mean, I do, that was sort of how I prepared was what you all as a group can do. There's obviously a whole set of things that have been discussed in really interesting and innovative ways to respond that I'm very excited by for the whole study to respond. Um, I hope that actually all the council members will submit comment individually in their capacity as private citizens, and I really appreciate the, the nudging for people um, uh, today. I think it's really, really wonderful. I think the need for accurate information, who's in, who's out, who's technically affected, all of that's been said really, really eloquently. Um, that's gonna be really key. We're very concerned about the ability of uh, the, the capacity of legal services to meet the needs of if the rule goes into effect, how are, because I, I think everyone in this room gets families are going to have to make some really wrenching choices, and they're really going to need a specific um, sort of some, some very t specific technical guidance from a legal service provider that understands public benefits. And then I think the policy solutions are really critical. Um, I think it's been really exciting to hear the, the, the possibilities that have been discussed and, and we stand ready to work with council and administration partners. Thank you. And Claudia, I wanna say thank you so much. You and your team, uh, along with so many other non nonprofits uh, and the town halls that are happening right now in discussion. Uh, the one tonight in Sunset Park will be uh, canceled because of weather. I'm watching the snow come down. So we're gonna, ca we're gonna cancel tonight's Brooklyn Town Hall, but we're going to be rescheduling that. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Miguelina Diaz. I am the Director of Benefit Access at Hunger Free New York City, which is a division of Hunger Free America. Um, our CEO, um, Joe Berg, feels passionate about this issue, and he's so sorry he couldn't make it today. Um, so, just some points that I want to make. Um, so make no mistake about it, um, if this proposal is implemented as proposed, um, it will increase poverty. And the worst symptom of poverty, such as hunger, homelessness, and early death in New York City and nationwide. Um, while new immigrant, immigrants have higher rates of poverty and lower median incomes than native-born Americans, immigrants who have become naturalized citizens have lower rates of poverty and higher median incomes than native-born Americans. So I'll just repeat that one more time. Um, while new immigrants have higher rates of poverty and lower median incomes than native-born Americans, immigrants who have become naturalized citizens have lower rates of poverty than higher median incomes than native-born Americans. Therefore, making it harder for new immigrants to obtain the temporary benefits they need to lift themselves out of poverty as they work will only hamper their ability to enter the economic mainstream of society. Uh, so President Trump's administration has implied that if the rule is implemented, nonprofit groups such as the one that I work for, Hunger Free America, and many of um, others that are sitting here next to me, will be able to pick up the slack. Um, that's nonsense. Many Americans, particularly uh, middle and low incomes, already donate and that's still not enough. Um, so, um, you know, this nation is historically welcoming immigrants. Now it is our job to ensure that we continue to welcome and seek safety, health, and freedom. Thank you very much. Hello. 
Okay, so thank you so much. I just want to thank the Committee on Health, General Welfare, and Immigration and the Council for having us here to draw attention to um, a really um, vicious and fear-mongering um, proposal that's coming from Washington. Uh, my name is Jerome Nathaniel. I'm the Senior Program Manager at City Harvest. Uh, City Harvest is one of the nation's oldest and largest food rescue operations. So we donate or distribute some 61 million pounds of donated food to emergency food programs, including pantries, soup kitchens, shelters, and um, also NYCHA facilities uh, that directly service some 1.2 million New Yorkers in need who don't know how or where they're gonna get their next meal. Um, like what was just mentioned from Hunger Free America, even with that, we cannot pick up the slack that SNAP does. In fact, for every meal that a food bank will distribute, SNAP can um, offer 12 meals uh, for the, the card holder. Um, so even with those relationships that a lot of our pantries and soup kitchen directors have with immigrant communities and really New Yorkers of all walk, walks of life, um, unfortunately, they simply cannot pick up the slack that SNAP does. And that's why we're very concerned uh, and we're voicing um, our support and aligning with some 1,100 different organizations across the nation uh, that signed on with uh, the Protecting, Immigration Fam uh, Protecting Immigrant Families Coalitions. And we're also activating our network of 500 different pantries, soup kitchens, and shelter directors uh, to participate this Monday in FRAC's National Comment Day. Um, so I'm very thankful that you guys have the laptop here, but as often and as much as the opportunity presents itself, uh, we're really urging people to comment on this um, as an individual and from an institution to really draw light on the individual stories that um, are happening and that are scaring away a lot of uh, even pantry clients that, that go to things like mobile markets as we speak, even though that's something that's not included in the public charge. So just being really mindful that even though it hasn't passed, the fear has already passed and it's already uh, bearing the consequences in some of these safe havens like pantries and soup kitchens uh, beyond and uh, next to uh, the fear that's happening along with SNAP. Um, I also just wanted to say as far as data goes, City Harvest, we recently uh, partnered with the New York Community Trust, the Women's Center for Education, and the United Way for New York City on a self-sufficiency standard, uh, which really looks into how people are balancing their food budgets uh, with just the living expenses of being a New Yorker. So looking at um, outside of SNAP and outside of these benefits, how challenging it is to live in New York. And if you didn't have those benefits, it would take some $76,000 for a family of three uh, to live comfortably in New York. So SNAP is lifting them out of poverty. Mm -hmm. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Hannah Scott. I'm a social service counselor and SNAP enroller at the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Um, I'm here today to represent um, our community of almost 12,000 families. I want to thank the City Council for this opportunity. Um, the West Side Campaign Against Hunger was founded in 1979, and we are the country's first supermarket style or choice model multi-service food pantry and one of the largest emergency food providers in New York City. In the last year, we provided 1.5 million pounds of food, which included over 400,000 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables to nearly 12,000 households. We offer our services to, to all New Yorkers regardless of immigration status, and we continue to strongly stand with immigrant communities throughout these continued attacks from the Trump administration. What I'm really here to say to you all is as a SNAP enroller, as a social service counselor, one of the many SNAP enrollers at Westside Campaign Against Hunger, we have a list, a list running of families, the date they've come to our organization and their family size, and the date that, and the benefit that they have either chose to disenroll from or not enroll on because of their fear of this proposed policy. It doesn't matter what I say, doesn't matter what my colleagues say, they, they will not enroll, they will not have the conversation. These are clients that have come to our organization for years, maybe. These are clients who have been referred to us from family or friends. We have trust, we have confianza with these people, and it doesn't matter. So 
what I'm here to say is these people are going to continue to rely on the emergency food system that we are all here a part of. We need more funds. We need supplemental funding to EFAP these people are going to continue to rely on us more and more, and we need to be the safety net for them. So though this has been very informative and, and, a, and a great you know, gathering of everyone here to talk about this, we need, we need funding and we need support to support these people because it, like I said, it doesn't matter how many times I explain this to a client. I can't fully reassure them whether or not this is going to affect them and their families. So thank you so much for this opportunity and I hope to you know, continue to hear more from you and to find out what we are going to do to further support the immigrants of this country and specifically of New York City. So thank you. Thank you for your service on, on not just the work that you're doing at Westside, but uh, in general for being here today and a general question for the for the panel we're gonna keep going not necessarily for now but understanding that data in aggregate not identify identifiable data is going to be important for us and really kind of building a larger budget request from all of you as you start anticipating and extrapolating from that need that you're seeing now so that as soon as you can get that that'd be great again we're on the budget negotiating team and we can we can start developing some of these needs uh, okay, that's a general, those are two general items. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Rose Duhan. I um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Community Health Care Association of New York State. The Community Health Care Association of New York State represents community health centers, um, or FQHCs, as they are also known. Here in New York City, we have 39 community health centers that operate 430, over 430 sites, and we serve 1.2 million patients a year. Um, as other, other panel members have, have indicated, we are very concerned about the impact on the population that we serve of the proposed rule. We have been collecting data. We've been surveying our health centers to get really specific information. Anecdotal, anecdotally, we have seen that um, a decrease in early prenatal care. One of our health centers has documented that there's been a decrease in women coming in for early prenatal care and concern about um, individuals with HIV not getting their, their medications. So we're already beginning to see that impact. Um, we, again, we do think that funding is really important. Um, estimates that we've seen say that up to 20% of Medicaid recipients may disenroll. So in New York City, that could be up to 50,000 uh, patients that we see at our health centers that we anticipate could be without health insurance. And then there will be a, you know, certainly a financial impact. We would be concerned about health. Um, I think we're, because of that, we are concerned about individuals being afraid to sign up individually. And so that being able to provide support directly to providers such as us, such as some of the panel members, where individuals don't have to identify themselves. We think that that's very important. So we would ask for that kind of consideration. And we also ask that the panel consider um, Chikanis as a resource and to promote community health centers as a source where patients can continue to get primary care, behavioral health care services, dental services, um, regardless of their income or their insurance status, and that we are available and a trusted resource in the community. Thank you. Sorry. My name is Rachel Sabella. I am the director of No Kid Hungry New York, which is a campaign of Share Our Strength. We're a national organization working to end childhood hunger, and I have the honor and privilege of taking that work here across New York State. Before I came down, I was sitting up in the balcony because I was thrilled to see how packed this room was. I actually checked the council website because I was having a little bit of deja vu. And March 15th, 2017, you, Chairman Chaka, hosted a hearing here by the Immigration Committee on the impact of new immigration enforcement tactics and what that could mean for New York City. And we sat here and less than two years ago, talked about things like this and talked about what this fear could do. And it saddens and hurts me and everyone here knowing that that is becoming a reality. But I also want to commend the council for knowing that this was to come and for bringing it to the attention then. Um, I have my written testimony here. Again, I came down late, so we'll make sure you get that. Um, nothing I am going to say is a surprise to anyone here. If this rules, these rules changes were, in a were to happen, we 
we would see increased hunger among children and families. And I think the word that I've continued to hear today, which is so striking, is fear. Because we know that anything that drives people into the shadows increases those hardships. And I think this council in particular has put so much attention on school meal programs. And while school meals is not included in this language, we've heard a lot of rumors and we know what fear does. And when more than 900,000 children are eating meals, 900,000 meals are served each day in New York City public schools, what would that do because of people's fears? So I'm going to be brief because we want more people to testify and we want everyone to get home before the snow. All I can do is say thank you um, and encourage everybody to raise your voices. We are doing that. We've also engaged our chef community led by Chef Jose Andres who have encouraged everyone to put their voices to get up on the record and take, make their voices heard on why this is terrible. So we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know your testimonies have uh, recommendations, and so we're going to be looking towards that and potentially uh, most likely contacting you later about budgets and need so that we can get that in early. Thank you. Next panel, we have uh, from the Brooklyn Defender Services, Ms. Ms. Hickey, the Legal Aid Society, uh, Hassan Shafikia, uh, the Bronx Legal Services, uh, Paula Arabalaida, the Legal Services of NYC, Ms. Tanya Wong, the Director of Government. The government bench. What is? What was that? Government benefits. Benefits. There you go. Sorry. And then Justine Khan from the door. I think I have everyone here. Okay, great. I think that's it for this panel. Hi, my name is Niasa Hickey, and I'm Immigration Counsel at Brooklyn Defender Services. We call on the City Council to pass these resolutions and submit a comment on the Federal Register and also continue to urge New Yorkers to submit individual comments as, as you have been doing today. We uh, strongly oppose the proposed rule on public charge. We echo what has already been said, that the proposed rule directly discriminates against and excludes middle income, low income, poor, and immigrant immigrant families from being able to seek long-term stable status in the United States. The rule change sends the message that low-income immigrants are not valuable community members and they're not welcome in the United States. We represent thousands of New York uh, non-citizen New Yorkers every day. Most, many of them live in mixed status households of U.S. citizens, LPRs, green card holders, visa holders, and people without documents. They're living together, working together, and supporting one another. Many of them will be affected if the proposed rule goes into effect. In our written testimony, we've, spe excuse me, in our written testimony, we've specified some of the categories of people who will be affected by the proposed rule. At BDS, we've already seen how the mere proposal of this rule has made immigrant families afraid to seek out programs and benefits that support their basic needs. We've been inundated with questions from our clients many of whom would not even be affected by the proposed rule, but are terrified nonetheless. Some clients are also refusing to apply for certain benefits even after we advise them that the rule change will not affect them. Under this atmosphere of fear and xenophobia, they are not assured by our analysis and our advice. Furthermore, many of our clients are being told by other people, agencies, unscrupulous lawyers, and the media that they are ineligible to apply for certain benefits and should withdraw from benefits immediately or face deportation. This is inaccurate and unnecessarily spreads fear. So we have two recommendations. First, we ask the city to improve training for city benefits navigators and other city staff who interact with and advise immigrant New Yorkers. Our immigrant clients seeking to enroll in benefits have already been mistakenly told by navigators that they do not qualify for benefits because they are non-citizens. This is not necessarily related to the public charge proposed rule, but is a continuing problem. They have also interrogated our clients about the basis of their employment authorization when they're trying to enroll in benefits, asking them why their social security numbers haven't been processed yet and asking other interrogatory questions that, are, um, that create more of a fear and a disincentive for people to enroll. 
In many of these cases, the navigators are simply uninformed about all of the complexities of immigration law. But BDS then has to use our staff resources to advocate with the benefits navigators to enroll our clients in the benefits that they are entitled to. And this has further deterred some of our clients from seeking the benefits they are entitled to and made them afraid of interacting with city agencies. We also ask the city to continue funding and supporting organizations like BDS that provide direct legal services and advice to immigrant New Yorkers. Immigration analysis and risk advisals has become increasingly complex. They require a lot of time investing in an individual's immigration history and applying the constantly changing and more stringent federal immigration policies. Applications that were previously considered to be simple are no longer simple. Each application requires an enormous amount of time and resources. They're subject to delays, require follow-ups in the forms of requests for evidence, and if they, they're denied under this administration, an individual faces the risk of deportation under the new referral of notice to appear um, a policy. As we've also heard, the time and resources required to give people the advice and counsel about the public charge rule, the proposed rule, how it might go into effect, are very intense and require a lot of resources. So I thank the City Council for supporting these resolutions as one of the ways that the city is reassuring immigrants that they are welcome and valued members of the New York City community. Thank you, and Hassan, before you go, uh, the, I think some of the bigger questions that you bring, that you've made me think about for folks as they focus their testimony are the kind of ways that legal needs are changing, the kind of applications that you're filing, are we talking more habeas corpus stuff that I'm, I know we're already seeing? But that kind of texture would be great. Um, and, and how you're tracking a kind of public charge impact in terms of budget increases and need. That those are the kind of things that would be great to hear from this panel. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Hassan Shafiqullah, the attorney in charge of the Immigration Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Um, I wanted to start by just answering two of the questions that had been posed to Commissioner Mustafi, and she said maybe legal service providers could answer them, so I'd like to take a stab at that. So one was whether an, an organization or an agency could serve as the affidavit of support sponsor um, or the, the signatory of an, uh, on an affidavit of support, um, which is a great idea and, and it's exciting to hear that the council is considering things along those lines, which is creative. Unfortunately, under the Immigration Nationality Act, Section 213, Capital A, paragraph F, um, it has to be an individual, um, citizen or a green card holder who's 18 or older and, and lives here, so it, it can't be an agency, so that's unfortunate. The second thing was a question about whether medical records need to be submitted as part of immigration applications. Generally, no. Um, if it's an application where you're seeking um, to show that hardship would, you, you yourself as the applicant would be seeking some sort of hardship, which some of them allow, you might need to um, provide medical records. But as part of this public charge proposed regulation, there's a pernicious new form that they're proposing, which was posted on the, the regulations website, which is called the 944 Declaration of Self-Sufficiency. And on this form, you have to list all kinds of things about yourself, including um, your work history, your credit report, or why you don't have a credit report, and give a letter saying that you don't have one, any fee uh, waiver you've ever asked for from immigration, and why and um, any past use of benefits ever. And I wanna get back to that in a moment because I think it implicates the city in terms, and the state in terms of a burden. But at the very end, it asks about reasonable accommodations. Are you gonna need a reasonable accommodation for whatever it is that you're seeking? So if I'm filling out a citizenship application, it makes sense to ask about that. Will I need some sort of interpretation or something? But this declaration of self-sufficiency, for them to ask me about reasonable accommodations on this form, seems like a backdoor way of trying to get at my medical situation. Like, will I actually become a public charge because I, I'll need an accommodation for X sort of um, condition? And so that is worrisome. Um, in terms of the past use of any benefits, an, an applicant who is subject to public charge, like anyone who's trying to get their green card through family member, um, not only would need an affidavit of support, but complete this form and list any benefits they've had in the past and show when it started, what it was, when you started, when it stopped. The burden on HRA and on the state level on DSS is gonna be tremendous. So in terms of city and, and state government doing comments and, and pushing back against this, um, I think that administrative burden is considerable. I only have 23 seconds left, so we have a couple recommendations. I'll just stand on my written testimony for those. Thank you. Hey, 
Good afternoon. My name is Tanya Wong, and I'm the Director of Government Benefits at Legal Services NYC. I'd like to thank the Council for calling this oversight hearing into this important issue. Um, legal Services NYC is the largest civil legal services provider in New York City and is dedicated to fighting for racial, social, and economic justice for all New Yorkers. Um, I'm going to skip some of the stats of the number of people that we represent, um, but we represent thousands of low-income New Yorkers access benefits, access and maintain benefits in New York City, many of which are non-citizens. Um, my comments are going to address the uh, impact and the harmful effects um, of the new rule, um, the chilling impact on uh, U.S. citizen children, um, uh, not being able to uh, avail themselves of SNAP benefits um, due to the chilling impact of this rule um, because non-citizens' parents, uh, fa their fears around accessing benefits and the negative impact on New York City's economy. Um, in addition, uh, I am going to make some comments about the impact on the whole, deepening the homelessness crisis in um, New York City and my colleague, Paula Arbolita from Bronx Legal Services, is going to address the impact that the new public charge uh, rule would have on HIV-affected individuals in particular. Um, so as my written testimony says, and I, I'll just try to hone in on the, uh, very succinctly on the rationale for our key recommendations, which are on the last page of our written testimony, um, but uh, we believe that the new rule would harm U.S. citizen children and have a negative impact on New York City's economy due to the loss of federal SNAP dollars. Um, I would um, commend to you the Fiscal Policy Institute's uh, simulations in which they uh, estimate the impact on um, New York City's economy and the number of people who will be impacted by this rule in New York City. Um, they estimate that oh, this rule will have a chilling impact on over uh, 2.8 million people in New York's um, in, in New York State, and um, more. You know, oh, I'm sorry, I, I just misstated that. Um, they e estimate that the chilling inf effect of the rule will impact 2.1 million people and 680,000 children in households that include one non-citizen um, and who are receiving one of the newly defined public benefits for the purposes of public charge under this new rule. Um, and uh, the recommendation that I want to point out to you is, um, and I'll be very brief, um, the, we believe that the New York City HRA needs to proactively take steps to protect the identities of um, ineligible non-citizens who uh, have U.S. citizen children who are eligible for SNAP and Medicaid. Um, the chair of the health committee, uh, Levine, mentioned that we need to be on the same page with the state. A lot of this data is in a state database, and um, we believe it will mitigate the chilling impact if we are sure that that information will remain confidential. Um, likewise, uh, Council Member Miller mentioned um, and asked about other city and state housing subsidies, which are indeed not listed as public benefits in this rule, in this in this um, proposed rule. However, um, in New York, it does the rule does talk about. Um, uh, ongoing income maintenance programs and list that as a public benefit. So our recommendation is that, uh, our second recommendation is that the, a the city needs to really uh, decouple and separate its housing subsidies from, um, that are not public benefits under this new rule and separate it from income maintenance cash programs because a lot of these housing subsidies in the city, they have this requirement of having an open public assistance case, and so I think it behooves the agents to, to really separate and decouple the housing, our, our unique city and state housing subsidies um, from ongoing general maintenance cash programs, which do count as um, income maintenance. And uh, I'll turn it over to Paula. Okay. 
So my name is Paula Arboleda. I'm the Deputy Director of Public Benefits and LGBTQ Advocacy Units at Bronx Legal Services. So Legal Services NYC assists hundreds of HIV positive individuals to access benefits, including Medicaid and other public health insurance programs. As, al it, as it's already been mentioned, one of the heavily weighed factors is related to medical conditions and use of subsidized health care. We believe that the inclusion in the as heavily weighed factors will result in adverse effects in general public health, including potentially an increase in new HIV diagnoses. And two, it's sort of a backdoor to a de facto reinstatement of the HIV entry ban. While the rate of new HIV diagnoses among the general population has remained steady, medical services providers have noted that the rate of new diagnoses for Latinx men who have sex with men rose by 13% from 2010 to 2014. Fear of deportation contributed to this trend by deterring people from getting tested or accessing care. These proposed changes come at a time when advocates and public health officials are working together to implement the governor's Ending the Epidemic Initiative, a three-point plan to move New York State closer to a decrease in HIV prevalence. It also undermines efforts to restructure the state's healthcare delivery system with the primary goal of reducing avoidable hospital use. Both efforts would be significantly undermined if the current proposal is passed because of the effect that it's going to have on health care costs because non-citizens will be using the emergency room to get treatment instead of accessing preventive care, ongoing care for chronic conditions through a traditional Medicaid-funded um, uh, provider. As I mentioned, the proposed new regulations could operate as a de facto ban on admission via a visa or adjustment of status to permanent residency of HIV positive immigrants to the US because of the medical condition slash health component of the proposal. Um, it's estimated that roughly 40% of HIV positive individuals in the US are treated by Medicaid and 87% live beneath 400% of the federal poverty limit, the baseline criteria for, subsidi for subsidies under the Affordable Care Act. Government spending on healthcare has been pivotal in managing HIV AIDS along with other federal, state, and local protections to fight discrimination and limitations um, and, and limiting access to individuals who are HIV positive. It would be difficult for an HIV positive person who's a non-citizen to, to withstand um, the proposed new regulations. As such, we recommend that New York City distinguish all benefits, services, including housing assistance, case management services, and health insurance based on HIV status from ongoing income maintenance programs um, already referred to by Tanya. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for all the work that you guys have already done and will continue to do. Um, my name is Justine Kahn and I'm here on behalf of The Door, a center of alternatives. Um, the Door stands with many of our colleagues across the city in opposition to the proposed changes um, to this public charge rule. So a little bit about our organization. For 40 years, The Door has served as an invaluable resource for New York City's youth, including those facing homelessness, unemployment, poverty, and deportation. Our mission is to empower young people to reach their full potential by providing comprehensive youth development services in a diverse and caring environment. Each year, we engage with nearly 11,000 young people, ages 12 to 24, many of whom face serious barriers with, which impact their ability to thrive. Compre comprehensive services are offered free of charge to adolescents, including career and education, food and nutrition, legal and immigration, primary and behavioral health care, creative arts programming, and supportive housing. So this proposed public charge rule is particular, <laughs> particularly infuriating for us at the door because of this variety of perspectives that we have due to this wraparound model. Um, so we're looking at it legally and healthcare-wise and housing and food um, and seeing all the ways that this would combat the services that we are so passionate about providing to our already underserved youth. Um, so I wanna focus a little bit on our legal center um, and explain what that team does. Um, and let me just note that I am not in the legal department, um, but you know it is important to this proposed change. 
Um, so each year, our Legal Services Center engages over 1,500 young people from all over the world and provides them with high quality representation in a wide range of civil legal matters, um, including family law, immigration, housing, employment issues, and public benefits. Our Legal Services Center has positioned itself as a, as a field leader in protecting unaccompanied minors seeking refuge in New York City and supporting them to obtain lawful, lawful permanent residence. A key part of our immigration practice is our participation in the I Care Coalition, an innovation public-private partnership designed to support the massage, massive surge in unaccompanied minors fleeing Central America and seeking permanent residency in the United States. Through I Care, we seek to ensure legal screenings for all children in removal proceedings and provide legal representation for those residing in New York City. <coughs> working both internally and collaboratively with our eye care partners, we have developed effective working systems for addressing the short and long-term long needs of the many young people arriving here fleeing horrific conditions, including gang violence, child abuse, dom domestic violence, hunger, and homelessness. Eye care has been critical to ensuring that these children have access to an attorney to fight for their right to remain in the United States, and it will continue to do so. The well-being of our young people is at stake because of the continued attacks they face by this administration. Over the past year, we have seen firsthand the unannounced, unannounced policy changes to the special immigrant juvenile status, which led to a dramatic increase in denials. So cases that we had been winning for decades were now being denied. Um, the public charge rule further complicates an already difficult conversation we must have with our clients. How, do we now suppose, how are we now supposed to advise a young person on what to do if this rule goes into effect? Must we, really must we really tell them to choose between accessing food, housing, and health care and putting their entire immigrant status in jeopardy? Um, I will stop there. Thank you. I have one question for this team. There, there are teams that we have already kind of pulled together around knife up for uh, detention and um, unaccompanied minors. Is there a group forming right now around public charge? Is that something that's happening and organizing itself? So there's been a, a coalition of groups, including the, um, Legal Aid and the New York Immigration Coalition and, and many of the folks here who've been working together on um, developing outward facing materials, client advisories, screening tools, um, Legal Aid, the Empire Justice Center and Make Through of New York are hopefully this week finally releasing our screening tool that um, caseworkers can use if they have a non-citizen sitting in front of them to see is it safe for them to receive benefits or not. Um, so there's a lot of coordinated advocacy um, going on around the city and around the state. And are you working with the bar? Is the bars, the, or the, the bar? Um, yes, we're working with the, both the New York City Bar Association and the State Bar Association. The state. Okay, cool. I think Immigration maybe they're here benefits. and they're going to testify later. Great. Thank you. And Tell with me. Bronx Legal Services, we've been working with the Bronx Immigration Partnership to hold community events. Our general legal services hotline that, um, that clients can call to get um, individualized screenings as to whether public charge applies to them, even if it were to pass. Um, and it's available Monday through Friday, 10 to 4. I'll also say they developed a fantastic screening tool, too, that we can share with the council. Awesome. Keep working together, and let's keep talking about needs and things that are changing on the ground. Thank you so much for your, for your testimony today. And make sure you submit it if you haven't. And you probably already filled out your comment, but fill out your <laughs> comment before you leave. Please, 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 please. How many, how many comments have we had so far? Four. We're still at four. Please, please just walk over there and make a comment. It's just so important. We got we had 17 done in the Bronx when we had our town hall earlier this week. Let's let's at least reach 17, please. Uh, okay. Next panel we have the Citizens Committee for Children of New York, Alice Bufkin. We have the HIV Law Project, Alicia Mohammed. This is part of Housing Works. Public Health Solutions, Marla Tepper. Planned Parenthood, Larissa Vasquez. Chelsea Goldinger, the LGBT Community Center. Please come on. Raise your hand if you're uh, waiting to testify. Great, thank you. Please, please hold. We're gonna try to get through as many as possible. And remember, please go out to the back and fill out your, your comment as you're here uh, listening to testimony. Uh, you can, you wanna start? Go for it. Just make sure it's red. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Chelsea Goldinger. I'm the Government Relations Manager at the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center, commonly known as the Center. Um, we offer a lot of different services affected by this proposed change. Uh, first of all, we have immigrant support services. We, have, we often write uh, asylum letters of support. Um, I think that's a big place that we've heard a lot of misinformation. That community is not impacted currently by the proposed changes. And we definitely had folks coming through our doors who are incredibly anxious about kind of what their application looks like and what that could mean for support they obviously desperately need. Um, I think on that same path, we've actually seen our wait list double for our support services in our immigrant support services team, uh, more than double in the past about three months. Um, which is pretty significant, and we are one of the only um, places with an LGBTQ-specific immigrant support services, and so we've definitely really seen that demand and doing a lot more referrals out. Um, in addition, we have actually a designated navigator agency from New York State to help folks enroll in the exchange, and we've actually seen people come through our doors and then come back a week later asking for help disenrolling in programs, um, which is pretty disheartening. Can you repeat that last? They're coming back yeah, for sure. what? Sorry? They're coming back they're coming they're back asking again. if they could disenroll. So we're in the enrollment period right now, of course, um, and that's been really alarming. And we've also seen, I mean, we don't have the final number since we're still in enrollment, but we've definitely seen a decline compared to what we usually see this time of year. Um, and then I think one little anecdote that we just thought was especially, just again, speaks to the misinformation we're hearing from this community. Um, we did hear from a woman who wasn't even specific to the healthcare, I was about SNAP benefits, and her son was in the process of applying for a citizenship who was already a legal permanent resident. She was like, so terrified um, that she disenrolled in all of her benefits and came to us looking just for food pantries because she no longer wanted to receive SNAP benefits. And again, the proposed rule wouldn't impact her. So I think from our perspective, one of the biggest things we're seeing is just overwhelming misinformation. Um, and we would love sort of just help kind of clarify that and kind of for these communities who are just so isolated and marginalized already, making sure that they feel safe and comfortable. So definitely excited about the work Empire State Justice and the others are doing to kind of help provide that and definitely support the council of taking action as a body um, against these proposed changes. Thank you, and an open question, if you can incorporate that into your testimony, is any factors that you're seeing that's a positive and constructive change of heart as you're seeing the fear? It'd be great to just kind of get any, any, any texture on, on who is it that needs to talk to them to, to um, land the message that they can stay enrolled right now. It'd be good yeah, to be here. Yeah, um, definitely. I think the biggest issue we have, and someone else spoke to this in their testimony as well, is misinformation from some attorneys who are coming, they're coming to us and they're saying, I was told don't enroll this year. This is gonna affect your status in a month. Um, and so it's really hard. We actually don't have any attorneys on our staff. Our staff is um, counselors and psychologists and support providers. Uh, and so it's hard for them to respond in a way that's convincing. So I think something from government is always helpful because um, that's of course another authority in that space. But I think that's Great. our challenge. If, and if anyone else can just speak to that too, what has it been a government official? Has it been one of us? Has it been one of you that have really changed the, or turned the corner around that bad, confused information to productive um, understanding? Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Alice Bufkin, and I'm the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health with Citizens Committee for Children of New York. We're an independent, multi-issue children's advocacy organization committed to making sure every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Um, thank you very much for having this hearing. It's, it's really critical. Um, you've heard extensively today already about the devastating impact of the public charge rule. Um, there's more information in, in my public comments with some of the data points that, that you may be familiar with, um, but it's very clear that, you know, in, in large part because of the chilling effect, we will see more women avoiding critical prenatal care. We'll see uh, impacts on the overall health of families. We know that cutting back on households' uh, uh, nutritional resources will mean more children will face food insecurity. And we know that in a city where we already have one in 10 students who are homeless, we're gonna see even more impacts on, on homelessness in New York. Um, so it's critically important that the Trump administration hear from as many people as possible in opposition. So very grateful to all the efforts that the city council is doing in that, in that way. Um, we strongly support both resolutions today. Um, and we do believe there are some additional steps that the 
city can take to address the potential impacts of this rule change. Um, first, we support the city, city's ongoing efforts to educate the public that the rule hasn't yet been, been finalized, um, to educate about who would and wouldn't be impacted, and to combat the chilling effect of families dropping out of services that aren't included in the rule. But it's clear from much of the testimony today and, and many other areas that um, many immigrants will continue to view it as unsafe to access public programs, even if they're not directly referenced in the rule. Um, New York City can combat this by supporting city-led programs that provide supplements to crucial federal health, housing, and nutritional support. So we already heard earlier about the importance of, of programs like EFAB. Um, you know, I, I know many members of this council are supportive of um, uh, Action Health NYC. So while that was privately funded, it is sort of an example of, of ways to specifically target immigrant communities and, and get them resources that they need. Um, and we also want to um, emphasize the importance of supporting existing universal programs um, that are available regardless of immigration status. So things like the, the school, universal school lunch. Um, I know you know that this you know, provides school lunch to, to all uh, students regardless of income or immigration status. Um, however, more work could be done to publicize the availability of school lunch and ensure that there's robust communication and promotion of this program and others like it. You know, we think at this time it's more important than ever to make sure that the programs we do have that are available get the kind of sort of outreach and education and promotion to make sure that, that they are sort of alternatives when, when uh, families are, are fearing accessing other programs. Um, and uh, we want to echo all of the, the comments in support of increased funding, training, and legal service connections for public benefit navigators and administrators. Um, you know, we appreciate the work that's already been, been done, um, but we know that you know, navigators and, and community health workers and HRI will all be critically important moving forward. Um, a key component of the success is ensuring that the workforce has adep adequate training around the public charge and has the resources they need to refer and connect clients to free legal care. Again, that's something that, that we've heard repeatedly today. Um, so any efforts the city can make to strengthen linkages between health and social service providers and legal services will help mitigate the impacts of this rule. Um, is that, yes, thank you. And, and just to echo the port for widespread support for legal services, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Larissa Vasquez and I'm the Associate Director of Community Engagement at Planned Parenthood of New York City. I would like to thank Committee Chair Council Member Stephen Levin, Carlos Manchaca, and Mark Levine for holding this important oversight hearing on the impact proposed changes to the public charge rule will have on New Yorkers, as well as your commitment to supporting immigrant New Yorkers access to health care. Planned Parenthood of New York City has been a leading provider of sexual and reproductive health services in New York City for over 100 years, reaching approximately 85,000 New Yorkers annually through our clinical and education programs. At PPNYC, I oversee our Promotores de Salud program. The Promotores de Salud are trained peer advocates and educators who aim to increase access to sexual and reproductive health services for Spanish dominant, dominant Latinx in New York City integrating information about health topics and the healthcare system into their community's culture, language, and value system. Over the summer of 2018, while providing medical interpretation on our mobile medical unit, our staff saw a patient who was very hesitant to be referred to the public hospital system for cancer follow-up because of what she had seen on the news about the public charge rule. The patient is undocumented and was afraid that if she accesses any public services, including basic health care, it would compromise her eligibility to apply for a visa or green card. We know that the earlier cancer is detected, the better the odds are for our patients. However, the fear of becoming a public charge became another obstacle for her to navigate, and she is not alone. Many members of immigrant communities have already expressed similar concerns. The proposed changes to public charge are another attack by the Trump-Pence administration on immigrant communities around the country. If enacted, the rules could harm more than 475,000 immigrant in immigrants in New York City. Of that, more than 75,000 immigrant New Yorkers will be forced to decide between accessing public benefits, obtaining their green cards, or other adjustments to their immigration status. The proposed rules greatly expands the scope of government benefits considered when determining who is a public charge. Medicaid, SNAP, public housing, and Section 8 housing assistance vouchers and low income subsidies for prescriptions for Medicare beneficiaries. These changes will, for, will force thousands of immigrant New Yorkers, including legal permanent residents who are not subjected to the public charge test, to withdraw from public benefits due to fear and misinformation. As a trusted healthcare provider, we see firsthand the challenges and barriers immigrant New Yorkers face when accessing care. When our financial counselors inquire about patients' immigration status, patients increasingly refuse to provide this information and no longer wanted to apply for insurance. 
Many patients would then also refuse to be screened for reduced fee services available regardless of documentation status, ultimately opting to pay the full fee for care. We expect that these occurrences are going to increase if the public charge rules change goes into effect. More broadly, the proposed rule on public charge would impact the existing public health crisis and exacerbate problems like food security, lack of affordable housing, and jeopardizing educational attainment. Um, we applaud your commitment to this, and we're really looking forward to working together and making sure that we can uh, help and, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, continue to work with the council and the administration and shared efforts to break down the barriers immigrant New Yorkers face in realizing safe and healthy lives. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Marla Tepper, General Counsel and Vice President of Legal Affairs at Public Health Solutions. Thank you so much for inviting us to testify today and for your commitment and strength in opposing this horrendous rule. I want to talk a little bit about public health solutions and then address some of the specific questions that came up today. We're one of the city's largest nonprofits and we support vulnerable New York City families and the communities that surround them in achieving optimal health and building pathways to reach their full potential. We focus on a wide range of public health issues that overwhelmingly affect the ability of underserved New Yorkers to live their healthiest lives. We do a lot of different types of work. We focus on food and nutrition, health insurance, maternal and child health, reproductive and sexual health, tobacco control, and HIV AIDS. So we are acutely aware of the impact of the, of the proposed rule. More than 40,000 low-income women women and children receive food and nutrition through our WIC program, the largest WIC program in New York State. You heard earlier about the data that we collected, which showed the chilling effect of the proposed rule even before it went into effect. And we've documented that in our testimony. Because of its, um, how, how telling it is, I'm going to just briefly touch on that. We saw the drop off, um, in, we've seen significant drop offs in our WIC caseload in the first and second quarters of 2017, and then again in the second quarter of 2018. The drop off numbers were highest in November 2016, January 2017, April 2017, and May 28. 2018. That correlated directly with President Trump's election and inauguration, the first leaked immigration order, and the second leaked order. In these months, drop-offs drop spiked to between f four and six times the usual rate, ranging from a drop-off of 395 to 640 families dropping out of our WIC program in contrast to the average WIC monthly attrition rate of 105. So that's pretty scary and telling as to what we can expect. We've been working with other advocacy groups, with Legal Aid, with the New York Immigration Coalition, and others, and we've been providing our clients with the phone number for the Ameri um, New Americans Hotline if they have questions about how the public charge rule applies to them. Providing people with information is really important. Like one of my colleagues here, we don't have lawyers on staff in each of our field offices. So connecting people to information is really critical. Good afternoon, Chairpersons Menchaca, Levin and Levine, members and staff of the Committees on Immigration, General Welfare and Health. My name is Alicia Mohammed. I'm the supervising immigration attorney at the HIV Law Project. On behalf of the HIV Law Project, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the impact of the proposed changes to the public charge regulations on the immigrant population living with HIV and AIDS in New York City. The HIV Law Project, a part of Housing Works, was founded in 1989 in response to the growing need for legal and advocacy services for low-income people living with HIV or AIDS in New York City. In addition to our policy advocacy and impact work, we have handled over 20,000 individual legal cases for our clients. The overwhelming majority receives public assistance and depends on Medicaid or ADAP to obtain access to HIV primary care. Most come from New York City's poorest communities and frequently have few educational, familial, and com community resources at their disposal. The HIV Law Project represents New Yorkers living with HIV in immigration, housing, and benefits. 
The HFA Law Project applauds your efforts to learn more about the impact of the proposed changes on the immigrant population in New York City living with HIV and AIDS. The new public charge rule would force immigrants living with HIV and AIDS to choose between either remaining in an unlawful status without critical subsistence benefits such as housing assistance, or B, filing for legal status and benefits only to scupper their immigration prospects as public charges. If finalized, the regulation would chill access to critical programs that help with housing, food, and other essentials for immigrants living with HIV. For individuals living with HIV, housing is healthcare. Indeed, a sub substantial body of research demonstrates that for people living with HIV and AIDS, housing is one of the most important factors in accessing medical care and maintaining one's health. In turn, by complying with treatment regimens, people living with HIV can reduce their viral load until it becomes undetectable by normal blood tests. According to the CDC, people who take ART daily as prescribed and achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load have effectively no risk of sexually transmitting the virus to an HIV negative partner. This is key to ending the epidemic. The public charge rule will have an immediate and devastating impact on the health and welfare of immigrants living with HIV AIDS and on the campaign to end AIDS. This is because under the proposal, immigrants who file an application with USCIS will be compelled to forego housing assistance and other life-sustaining benefits lest they be deemed a public charge. Before filing an application with USCIS, immigrants living with HIV rely upon ADAP, which is paid for under Part B of the Ryan White program for prescription drug coverage but go without Medicaid, food stamps, rental assistance, and other critical benefits. Currently, immigrants in New York can access these critical subsistence benefits through the HIV AIDS Services Administration after filing an application with the USCIS, thereby becoming PRUCOL, a person residing under color of law. Unlike ADAP, however, Medicaid is a target of the proposed regulation. Hence, the filing of any immigration application I have a couple of recommendations. Can I just go to them? Yeah, quickly? focus on the recommendations. Yes. Um, pass a resolution calling upon Governor Cuomo and the state government to require that funding for HIV, uh, Medicaid HIV AIDS coverage comes solely from Ryan White federal funds or from New York state only funds and launch an education campaign for immigrants living with HIV AIDS, reassuring them that medical coverage that does not impact their immigration status, ADAP and ADAP Plus, is available in the city and educate uh, the HRA staff on which benefits can be accessed without negatively legal affecting legalizing immigration status so that they can provide accurate guidance to immigrants living with HIV and AIDS. Thank you. And with that, I wanna say thank you for this panel. Uh, be safe out there. It's getting dark and cold and snowy. Thank you so much. And we're gonna keep working together to figure out how to how to address not just the issues that you're, that you're bringing up, but how to get the information out to everybody else. Our next panel, thank you. We have from the NASW NYC chapter, uh, Marlon Agustin Mendez. The NASW NYC chapter, Emma Cathal. Uh, they're from, from the NASW and, uh, New York City Immigration and Global Committee, Astrid Casasola. Ernie Collette from the NYC Bar Association. Thanks for staying, Ernie. Uh, New York Legal Assistance Group, Joseph Lavelle Wilson, and then uh, Nylag. Abby uh, Biberman? Biberman. Thank One more? Biberman. Thank you. Uh, let's get you all onto the, to the panel. And are the rest that I called not here? Okay, well, you couldn't say you're not here if you're not here. Uh, okay, so it looks like we have a few slots open. Can I look at the next panel? Okay, so let's get on the Asian Immigrant Advocate CPA, May Lee, onto this panel. Um, Albert Khan, if you're here. Uh, let's get you from CARE. Uh, and then, uh, Dmitry uh, Glinsky from the Russian Speaking Community Council. And then I'll we'll keep this. And I think that'll fill us up for the 
panel. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, she went to the restroom. Okay, great. Okay, so let's wait for. Uh, is the Asian American advocate uh, at a car here? Yes. Let's get you on, Ms. Pradam. Pradam. And then CPC, Carolyn Cowan. Carolyn, is that you? Okay. Okay, great. Dimitri, would you like to start? This was uh, make sure, okay. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, okay, dear members of the committee and fellow New Yorkers, uh, hermanos y hermanos, Nuevo Arquinos, uh, buenas tardes, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you uh, for all those who convened this very important uh, hearing and for uh, the committee staff for inviting uh, me to testify as a community organizer and an immigrant myself. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Russian-speaking community council that since 2011 uh, has been as an all-volunteer a non-profit organizing and advocating for about 200,000 immigrants and new Americans from former Soviet countries, the third largest linguistic minority in our city. There are two parts to my one-page testimony uh, that will be distributed to you shortly. Uh, first of all, our organization fully supports uh, what uh, has been uh, already said before very eloquently, including today, that this DHS proposal is harmful to our communities, uh, especially to American families with non-US uh, members, uh, to immigrants with children in need. It's harmful to our economy. Specifically, I would like to say that in my own immigrant community, Many high-skilled professionals have to use uh, these uh, public benefits in their first years in the U.S. because of the rejection and discrimination they are facing in this initial period before they are able to break through these barriers to an income that matches their economic value, and their use of public benefits is later compensated many times over by the, by the benefits accruing to the U.S. economy through their and their children uh, work and entrepreneurship. For this and many other reasons, RCC uh, supports, uh, fully supports the resolutions proposed here. This morning I submitted uh, my public comment on behalf of our organization, as thousands more people have done. We encourage uh, the folks in our community also to submit their public comments, but we also encourage what I heard today, a conversation about city proactively looking for solutions to what might happen, and we have some uh, 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 proposals that uh, I have no time to expand on today, uh, including proposals related to the, uh, the bond of $10,000 or more that the new proposal might uh, enforce on uh, people found to be likely public charge. But now I'd like to go to the second half of my testimony, and that's uh, very important for us to convey. Our group of organizations uh, that are immigrant-led believes that our progressive city government should not only be on the defensive against what is, what is coming from Washington, but that it should also keep expanding the rights and opportunities for immigrant New Yorkers. Uh, and uh, that uh, in the words that were spoken today by Speaker uh, Johnson should uh, stand as a beacon on the hill uh, in this uh, sea of madness. And in this connection, our city has uh, uh, the immigrant population that is bigger than the entire population of, for example, Chicago, the third largest city in the States, or of Paris and Rome, yet immigrants as a group have no institutionalized representation within our city government. In contrast, such cities as San Francisco and Portland have set up commissions on immigrant affairs that include representatives from their immigrant communities. I'll just finish saying that we ask our city to catch up with them by creating such a commission that would have broader responsibilities in immigrant integration. We brought this proposal to the City Charter Revision Commission where, we're, where we were invited to testify, and today we are here to bring you the awareness of this campaign that we have launched. We hope that many of you here in this room will give it a thought and will, will sooner or later to support it, and that before long, it will also be up for discussion in this committee. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And if we can go to your left, mm -hmm. we'll just get you on. Can we switch uh, chairs? Oh, no, actually, if you can sit, if you're fine there, you can, yeah. you can testify from there. Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Cowan, pronouns she, they, and I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC serves over 60,000 Asian American, low-income, and immigrant New Yorkers each year, the exact population that's gonna be impacted by this public charge rule. 
I would like to emphasize, as others have, that nothing has changed and the proposed rule hasn't been finalized. And also that this proposed rule never has to be finalized to have the exact impact it's intended to have, which is driving immigrant families into the shadows and systematically denying them of resources needed to survive and thrive. We've already seen the impact at CPC, even though the proposed rule has never been finalized. We have seen seniors asking to de-enroll from their SNAP benefits, which they depend on to put food on the table. We have seen people asking to de-enroll from the wait lists for housing vouchers that they've been on for years or not apply for Section 8 housing. We've seen people asking about their prescription medications and if they should stop taking them so that they can apply for their green card. When we were doing rapid response trainings with our staff on how to talk to community members, and keep in mind that many human services staff are gonna be impacted directly by this rule as well, one of our social workers asked me, what should I do, tell my NYCHA clients to go live on the streets so that they can apply for their green card? While the city has made an incredible commitment to protecting immigrant New Yorkers should this go through, the time for a coordinated response is now, and it has to be centered on the community-based organizations that have deep trust with the communities that are gonna be impacted by this the most. We have seen misinformation in the media. We've heard of predatory immigration lawyers providing misinformation to people. And nothing that CPC, a community organization that has had deep connections in the community for over 50 years, has said to our community members has dispelled that fear. So imagine when that information comes from the government. In this climate, a notice from the government, even a sanctuary government like New York City, can drive deep fear. We've had community members come into our centers in full-scale panic attacks because they've received information with a city seal on it, um, only to find out later that it was just a simple generic notice. While efforts from Moya to do translated flyers and other efforts like that are greatly appreciated, the website, which is where the bulk of the information lies, is still only in English, which leaves community organizations to fill the gaps. So I would urge the city and the city council as it moves forward with its response to not wait until the rule is finalized, but to respond now, coordinated with the community-based organizations that have the community trust and have the language ability to dispel the fears, to help immigrants remain in their benefits, and to plan for whatever might come down the line. Thank you again for your commitment to immigrant New Yorkers and to fighting this rule. Thank you, Ms. Cowan, and we don't disagree with you at all on any one of those points, analysis, and recommendations. Uh, uh, Chair Levine has a question for you. Great remarks, Carlin. You use the term predatory attorneys, and we've heard today from other advocates who've described attorneys who are misinformed and were offering incorrect information, but it sounds like you're talking about attorneys who are trying to extract money out of unwitting clients and using fear. Have you actually encountered, that this would be horrifying, have you encountered such cases? So I wanna be clear that there are incredible attorneys that are doing really important work to protect uh, immigrant New Yorkers. There are also attorneys that simply have misinformation and this is a very difficult rule. It's very complex and convoluted and there are so many nuances to it. The misinformation is easy to occur. And we have seen consistently, whether with public charge or whether with other areas of immigration, that if community members are not seeking information from trusted sources, from trusted immigrant attorneys, there are always gonna be people that are ready to take advantage of climates of fear. Well, I'm glad you brought this up and we as a city council and really everyone who's advocating for the community's effective need to have uh, our antennas up for anyone who's attempting to exploit the fear to make a buck, whether they're attorneys or other providers. And if anyone knows the specific cases, please contact city government so that we can enforce uh, aggressively against uh, that kind of abhorrent behavior. Th thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Albert Tan. I'm the legal director of the Council on American Islamic Relations of New York. I'm very grateful to chairs Levine, Levin, and Menchaca for once again standing with immigrant communities in the face of this repugnant attack from Washington. And I wanna draw your attention to the unique impact that this uh, proposal would have on Muslim New Yorkers who have faced a systematic attack from DC. 
who have faced the specter of Donald Trump's campaign pledge of a Muslim registry, who ha have seen attempts to work with law enforcement, to work with ICE, to gather information on these communities. And so the threatened in privacy implications of public charge have a unique impact on this community. And while, yes, the city did pass intros 1557 and 1588 uh, last term, I would remind the council that there were carve-outs in those bills applicable to investigative purposes that could do remain uh, vulnerabilities for t marginalized communities. And we once again would raise the importance of closing those loopholes and making sure that every area of city government is held to the same uh, standard of privacy protection. We've seen what the Trump administration has been able to accomplish in consular uh, visa denials using uh, public charge. They have tripled the number of denials in the last, uh, in the last fiscal year, tripled. And, and so we are terrified at what might happen if this rule were to go through. But I want to reiterate what has been said so many times before, that this is a threat. It is a real threat, it is an imminent threat, but it is not something that's gone into effect yet. And like so many other groups up here, we have seen individuals proactively disenrolling from programs, and we urge anyone who is impacted to remain on programs and to not uh, stop using any of the vital services that are impacted by this rule while it is being finalized and while it is being fought. I also want to highlight that individuals can potentially uh, submit more than one comment if they do it through affiliation with more than one organization. Ms. Callan and I, for example, have authored a comment through our uh, participation in Coro's ICLP leadership program, in addition to comments through our respective organizations. And so individuals can potentially have more than just one comment if they're speaking to different elements of this uh, rule change. And I, I really urge everyone here to reach out to as many people as they can to have as many comments as possible because one comment is an important symbol. And a thousand comments is a real breakthrough, but a million comments is the sort of mass movement we need to stop this horrific policy change. I'm so hopeful the council will help us reach that goal. At this point, I should say good evening. Uh, good evening, my name is uh, Ernie Collette, and I'm here in my capacity as a member of the Immigration and Nationality Law Committee of the New York City Bar Association. So I just wanna briefly uh, emphasize what, what has already been said um, in that the City Bar uh, supports the proposed council resolution 608 and 609. Um, and we obviously um, urge the federal government not to move forward with its adoption of this public charge rule. Uh, unfortunately, um, as uh, Councilmember Menchaca pointed out, um, we are uh, at a point where this rule is being published. Um, it may be finalized. The whole point of the public comment period is to bring attention to the federal government how uh, many people are against uh, this, pro uh, this proposed change. Um, but if they do implement it, we do need to be prepared. Um, and one of the things that I do want to point out is that the New York City Bar Association um, is prepared. We work with several, uh, many, many different organizations um, and many different subcommittees to prepare um, our members uh, to have the adequate information and tools and resources necessary to be able to provide uh, information to their clients. Because while I work um, at a, a nonprofit organization called Mobilization for Justice, and I do uh, work in benefits and in immigration law, a lot of private attorneys uh, do need to focus uh, primarily on other issues and don't necessarily know much about public charge. So it'll be our responsibility um, as an organization and as a committee to ensure that lawyers in the private and the public sector are prepared for this. And we encourage the city council to support us in these measures as well. I also, the reason why I say that too is because the public charge regulation in the way that it's written is purposely confusing. Uh, it creates sort of these bright line rules where if you're under 125% of the federal poverty level, you'll have a negative weighted factor for public charge. If subsequently you're over 250% of the federal poverty level, which is about $63,000 a year in income and resources uh, for a family of four, you would have a positive factor. But that doesn't necessarily mitigate the fact that if you've received public benefits um, going forward in the future, once the rule is finalized, that that will be impacted. 
impacted. Uh, you also divide the benefits between monetizable and non-monetizable benefits. And depending upon how much you've received in a given course of a year or the amount, uh, those, public, uh, those public benefits could be charged against you. This information needs to be simplified. It needs to be provided to the community, not only to the individual constituents and also our clients, but it also needs to be provided to the attorneys that will be serving these clients. And so it's very important for all of us to take that into consideration. And with my limited time left, I'm taking off my city bar hat, putting on my uh, attorney hat. Um, one of the things that was mentioned also was the I-944 that my colleague uh, Hassan mentioned. Um, it's over expansive comparative to the public charge rule. They will ask for information about any prior fee waivers that you've received um, or credit reports as well. And that information can be uh, confusing or impossible to get for um, members of our communities. As well, uh, one of the other issues that the city, uh, sorry, that the city council mentioned that we talked about was maybe sponsoring individuals. And while it's not codified in the INA, there is a section in the uh, public charge regulation about a $10,000 bond. That's something that may be discussed and discovered uh, to, to talk about in the future within other organizations. So thank you for your time. Sorry for going over. Uh, one, one quick question on, on what you just presented. On the, you mentioned the initiative to train, talk to, communicate with lawyers, your lawyers, public and private. Uh, the, talk, to us a, talk to us a little bit about what that looks like and in terms of funding needs you might be requesting or is that just part of your, your work already? Have you committed, have you communicated anything yet in a blast to folks and we, give us a little texture about what, what sure. you've done. We haven't, but in the past what we've done with several subcommittees, including the Social Welfare Committee and the Immigration and Nationality Committee, which I'm a part of, we create trainings um, and events at the City Bar Association. Um, those are passed through the City Bar Association to ensure, um, if they're CLE events, to ensure that the information is adequate and correct um, to properly and adequately train individuals upon uh, common topics. Um, that information about funding or promotion would be uh, better suited to the individuals that are listed um, as the contact for people um, on the City Bar Association's, uh, on the uh, recommendation that we just uh, proposed. But in general, uh, it would be a fantastic opportunity for us at the minimum for advertisement to be able to allow uh, attorneys and other individuals to know that this exists. Hello, good evening. My name is Emma Caffel, and I'm here with my colleagues Marlon Augustine Mendez and Astrid Casasola, and we are Master of Social Work students at Columbia University and active members and interns of the Immigration and Global Social Work Committee of the National Association of Social Workers, New York City Chapter, and today we are be, uh, testifying on their behalf. The New York City Chapter of the NASW represents over 6,000 members throughout the five boroughs. The NASW is the largest association of social workers in the world with over 120,000 members across the nation. We are leaders in advocating for just social policies, and we thank the New York City Council for the opportunity to testify. Today, we're gonna to give a brief economic analysis behind this policy. Um, it is a common notion in the United States that immigrants suck up the, the public benefits of the country while not contributing to the economy. However, several reports and news coverage have discovered quite the opposite. For example, it was found that in 2013, about 3.7% of immigrants in the nation received cash benefits compared to 3.4% of the US born population. The proposal seeks to increase the income requirements as mentioned just a second ago for potential immigrants. This would mean that they would have to earn between 30,000 for an individual and six, about 63,000 for a family of four. As a, comp as a comparison, virtually 29% of US citizens would fail this test. Um, the DHS seeks to aid a burden on taxpayers, as the proposal states. However, immigrants are an asset to this nation's economy. In fact, it could be argued that with fewer immigrants in the United States, the country's economy would suffer. Second generation immigrants are among the strongest economic and fiscal contributors in the US population, and they have contributed more in taxes than the rest of the, na than the, rest of the native born population in 2017. Furthermore, it has been demonstrated that employment rates are high even among immigrants who partake in public benefit programs. 
For example, of benefit receiving families, 63% of non-citizens and 66% of naturalized citizens are employed, while only 51% of native born benefit receiving families are employed. Restraining the amount of immigrants admitted to the United States could also leave the nation at a vulnerable position during the current US employment boom. Forbes analysis Josh Burson examines a new problem taking place in the nation, which is a labor shortage, as well as an all-time low fertility rate. Therefore, employ employees are needed and immigrants can make a difference. Um, so in conclusion, um, the National Association of Social Workers, NYC chapter, concurs with a large and diverse coalition of immigration advocates, health organizations, physician groups, hospitals, and patient advocates who strongly denounce this heartless and punitive proposal. Instead of implementing the proposed public charge policy change, we contend it is best for children and families, as well as for the public health and well-being, and to the nation's economy, to retain the current criteria as established by the 1999 ruling. We implore everyone here today to make a public comment condemning this proposal before December 10th. And we are also urging the social work community in New York City, as well as nationally, to make a public comment. Um, as a nation that prides itself on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that has a heart and conscience, we cannot allow this public charge to, to happen. Thank you. Uh, chairs, council members, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address you. Uh, my name is Joseph Lavelle Wilson. I am a staff attorney with the New York Legal Assistance Group, known as NILAG. I'm here today with my colleague, she's just stepped out, uh, Abby Bieberman. Um, she's a supervising attorney in NILAG's Public Benefits Unit. Um, NILAG uses the power of the law to help New Yorkers in need uh, combat social and economic injustice by addressing emerging and urgent legal needs with comprehensive free civil legal services impact litigation, policy advocacy, and community education. Uh, you've already heard extensively how the proposed rule will expand the range of benefits that can be used to deny an application for a green card or a visa. So I'm gonna focus my testimony today on the impacts that we're seeing and um, what the city can do to help. So at NILAG, since the rule's been introduced or announced, uh, it's not obviously not um, in effect yet, uh, we've seen already again and again uh, clients misunderstanding the rule, needlessly terminating benefits or not applying for benefits to which they're entitled, even when they don't fall under the proposed rule and, and would not when it's implemented. Uh, one example of that is we've heard from staff that we work with at health and hospitals um, that women on temporary visitor visas are concerned about accessing prenatal Medicaid and WIC for their children born in the US. Uh, because at some point they intend to return to their home countries and they want the ability to revisit the US in the future. Others are concerned because they want to apply for citizenship in the future and they fear that accessing benefits now will hinder them. Uh, one of the worst outcomes of the chilling effect has been clients foregoing necessary cancer treatments due to fear of being seen as a public charge or being deported. Um, one story of that is Dana, uh, who's an undocumented immigrant from Georgia, she's been in the US for nearly 20 years, has two children with DACA status and several US citizen grandchildren. Several months ago, she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma and began chemotherapy funded through New York State Emergency Medicaid. Dana was referred to NILAG to see if she had an immigration remedy uh, that would make her eligible for full New York State funded Medicaid um, and that would cover the necessary stem cell transplant that represented the best option for her cancer treatment. After she was referred, Dana missed several appointments, both with uh, NILAG and her medical team, fearing that she would be deported due to the medical treatment she was receiving. When she finally met with a NILAG attorney, she revealed that she was trying to not take too much chemo uh, in order to avoid the radar of immigration officials. She was terrified of pursuing any options that would make her Medicaid eligible or, <clears throat> excuse me, or force her to reveal her address, fearing that it would get her family in trouble. Although she agreed to resume her chemotherapy after meeting with the attorney, uh, the doctor recently informed the attorney that she stopped showing up to appointments, which will likely speed up resistance to the drug. Uh, we fear that cases like this are gonna become much more common, and as I'm out of time, I'll refer to my written testimony on the recommendations that we're proposing to the city. Thank you. Well, I just want to ask you to outline them really quick, the recommendations. Okay, uh, 
We think that city agencies should be looking to legal service providers who they already contract with on many projects to provide information and training on how the public charge rule is going to um, affect immigrant New Yorkers. Uh, that will ensure New Yorkers are getting um, accurate information about whether they'll be affected and how. Uh, we're also recommending a, that the city launch a media campaign about the rule, um, similar to campaigns uh, that the city's already done um, on subway ads, Link NYC, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we're also asking the city to work with the state to look into how to clarify the um, tangled benefits, as they were put by council by Chair Levine, uh, and to clarify what funding funds which um, benefits, so that immigrants can understand whether or not they're going to be affected. Um, and finally, we'd recommend that uh, the City Council work with the state to look into potential stopgap non-means-tested benefits, uh, which won't be subject to the public, public charge rule. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste and good evening. My name is Sandhya Pradhan. I am a health navigator at Adikal. We are the only women-led worker at community center serving and organizing the Nepali-speaking community in New York City. Today, I am speaking on behalf of almost 60,000 Nepali speakers in the greater New York City area. We are new immigrants and low-wage workers working as domestic workers, nail salon workers, restaurant workers, and gas station workers. The recent public charge rule, charge rule proposal would negatively impact our community. As many of our members are beneficiaries of Medicaid or no-cost health insurance and SNAP. If this rule change were to be passed, our member would be put in the situation where they must choose between public charge, uh, uh, public benefit to help them survive and support the families or be eligible for permanent residency and stay in the country. This is not a decision that any immigrant should have to make. We know that if they are forced to make this decision, given this political climate with attacks against immigrants, our members may become more at risk if they are uninsured or are unable to receive food stamps to sustain their families. The Trump administration wants to say that immigrants should not be dependent on public benefits if they are to be eligible to stay in the United States. But we know that even if an immigrant decided not to take public benefits and pay for health insurance out of their own, it is still not affordable, pushing the family further into poverty, making them more in need of public benefits. It is a cycle that merely expanding the definition of public charge will not solve by itself. Many Nepali-speaking immigrants come to the U.S. in hopes of a better life and a better future of their families. The transition of our new immigrants is very difficult, and our, an organization, organization like Adika try our best to help new immigrants once they arrive. However, public benefits serve an important purpose to help new immigrants. I see so many new immigrants come through the doors at Adika every day who are overwhelmed by the challenges of everything from finding a job, enrolling their children in school, learning English, understanding the law here, and more. To restrict what types of immigrants are eligible to apply for green card, also spread a message that there is a good type of immigrant and a bad type of immigrant, which is a false idea and discriminatory. Low-wage working class immigrants are important parts of, sorry, parts of our society and economy. These workers are part of, of the individual workforce are the people who make it so you can go to work and jo enjoy your life without concern. Do you have any recommendations that you can, you can point to in the testimony that we can hear today? Uh, it's for like a public, uh, it's like uh, right now I don't have the answer, but we can. Okay. Yes. So we must support our working class immigrant communities because they are backbone of the city and the countries. I request the city to hear our testimonies today and let the United States government know that New York City will not stand for the public charge proposal. 
Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, and we look for, for, forward to working with you and the organization on specifically the population that, that we that you spoke to, but also recommendations that might be coming to support the organization itself. A very unique uh, opportunity that we have, as was mentioned earlier, that you all have connections to communities with trust. And that was a question that I asked earlier about how, how do we change the, the nature of the, of the confusion, and you are all at the front lines of community engagement uh, at, at, at a cultural um, ability for trust. And, uh, and that, that's not always gonna come out with government. <laughs> We're, uh, as a whole, government is failing its people right now. Okay, thank you so much to this panel. Next panel, we have, I think, two panels, maybe one. We'll see if everyone is here. Asian American Federation, uh, Persephone, come on up, please. And Asian American Advocate, CPA, Mei Li. Uh, Selvia Sichter, Asian American Advocate, India Home. Carrie Cecil, the Arab American Family Support, Asian American Advocate, Grace Kim, Tasfia ba uh, Rahman, Asian American Advocate, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, and then Hiroko Hatakana, no, Hatanaka, Japanese American Social Services, Inc., and is Great, we have a full panel. And Persephone, would you like to go first, please? Hello. Um, thank you, Chair Manchaka, Chair Levin, and Chair Levy, for, and the Committees on Immigration, General Welfare, and Health for convening this hearing today. And thank you to the city agencies. I don't know if staff are still here. I assume they are um, for being here today as well. I am Persephone Tan, the Associate Director of Immigration and Policy. Um, at the Asian American Federation. We represent a network of over 60 member agencies and partner agent, uh, member organizations and partner agencies that are Asian led and Asian serving. Um, of this panel, I think pretty much everyone here is a member or a partner agency. Overall, Asians make up 15% and growing of the city's population among this group. 70% of Asian New Yorkers are immigrants. So immigration is a very important topic to our community. The proposed public charge rule as released by Trump administration presents an unnecessary burden and fear among immigrant communities. I would like to share some statistics on Asian immigrant New Yorkers from Man and Health and the Migration Policy Institute. Estimates of those impacted by this proposed public charge rule in the Asian community are well over a quarter million non-citizen and family members living in New York State. These are people who have either had who either had income below 125% of the federal poverty level or received one of the benefits in the proposed rule. The Migration Policy Institute estimates that more than half of the recent Asian immigrants of New York State have incomes below the 250% of the federal poverty level, which is the proposed income cutoff for application of the public charge test. This means that more than half of new Asian immigrants coming to the U.S. would face increased burden to pass a public charge test. Our recommendations to the city and to the corresponding agencies responsible for the welfare of immigrant New Yorkers include comprehensive public outreach and education. Um, the city should remind constituents that the rule is not final, not retroactive, and the public charge test will be looking at the totality of circumstances. We need to make sure that there's clear messaging now and clear messaging when the rule is actually finalized. Encourage people to apply for benefits and not disenroll uh, and not to discontinue enrollment. Emphasize it is a very narrow scope of immigrants impacted, only those who are applying for green cards. Hence, there should be free legal services available in language about evaluating an individual's public charge status to see if they are at risk for being covered by the public charge test and how to mitigate it. There should also be a clear process on where people can get help and identify if they are at risk of being a public charge. Um, for example, having clear messaging on whether or not people should go to Action NYC or the New Americans Hotline or knowing when to reach out to our, uh, HRA about public benefits. 
Um, I do want to note one thing about addressing the fee waiver of uh, immigration benefit criteria. It's in my testimony. I hope uh, the council on the committees will take a look at it as well. And finally, the city should strengthen partnerships with uh, community nonprofits and other organizing groups. We have been on the forefront of convening rapid responses to the ongoing attacks on immigrants, and this includes providing groups like ours and everyone on this panel and everyone who's already testified um, with resources and funding to build capacity so that we can continue outreaching to the communities. Thank you so much. Thank you, and what I will ask and what I, we, we are gonna continue to ask for are budget recommendations and as a coalition and really understanding the need itself so we cannot just understand the the, the coalition request, but the intricate nature of the legal side, the education side, et cetera, that, and which I think you presented, but with some dollar amounts, so we can be ready. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, so thank you for having this hearing today. Um, my name is Mei Li. I am the executive director of the Chinese Progressive Association. Uh, we serve those who live, work, or go to school in Chinatown or the Lower East Side. Uh, so we assist immigrants with programs like English classes, citizenship classes. We have some immigration application assistance. Uh, we do help new citizens to register to vote. Um, but I wanted to share a story and make some recommendations. So I said we have these citizenship classes, and in our class we have students who are green card holders, but nevertheless, even though they're enrolled in the class, they told us they didn't plan to apply just yet for citizenship. Um, they're on Medicaid, so the plan is that they're going to wait for the Medicaid to expire. They won't go to recertify, and after they're off the Medicaid, they'll get, this is health insurance, they're going to apply for their citizenship. Um, so we managed to convince them, we're armed with a lot of the correct information, we managed to convince them, no, that's not what you need to do, you should apply for citizenship now if you're otherwise eligible. So they will be, and also our teachers will be, um, uh, making these lesson plans for the students to teach them how to submit the comments. And they might do it in a class on their little iPads or phones. Um, so then, so the other thing is um, we've heard about how, you know, HRA, um, for their frontline staff is trained to talk to the, uh, the clients and Moya and Action NYC is doing a lot of outreach, but we think that's not enough. You know, we think, I think it would be better if HRA was much more proactive and sent the letter out to the clients right away instead of waiting for them to come. The students I talked about haven't been to HRA and they haven't called Action NYC. So I think the dependence on those, on what they're depending on is not sustainable considering the scope of the, the breadth, you know, of the confusion and it will get worse if, I mean, I hope this doesn't happen, and I don't want to, we don't want to tell people well, it's going to happen anyway, so you should deal with it now. You know, n now the message is to fight. Um, but if it does happen, the confusion will be even more widespread. The thing that I mentioned about Medicaid, Medicaid, you know, is very complicated. There's federal Medicaid and there's state Medicaid, and it's not all the same. So it may apply to public charge or it may not. I don't know how it's gonna play out. So there's gonna be a lot of, um, a lot of resources that need to go directly to community groups so that they can be, not just be armed with the information, but actually have the manpower and the funding to deal with the people that I'm talking about right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for convening this hearing today and giving us the opportunity to testify. I'm Sylvia Sigdar, I work in India Home. And India Home is a nonprofit organization. We work for the South Asian uh, older adults. We serve more than 200 uh, adults across Queens through our senior center programs, case management, community mental health programs, recreational activities, and advocacy. 100% of our seniors India Home serves are foreign born. As you know, on October 10, 2018, the Trump ad administration formally announced a proposed regulation that would dramatically broaden the public trust test that has been a part of federal immigration law for decades. The South Asian older adults we work with are vulnerable new immigrants themselves who live in poverty, depend on adult children, speak little English, have low to no income, and share are socially isolated. Public benefit programs support these older adults' basic needs in terms of access to health care, food, and other essentials. We foresee it having a huge impact on our vulnerable South Asian older adult community. It's important for the wellness of our seniors to have the nutritious foods and ingredients from the cultural diets that they are accustomed 
to the SNAP makes this possible for close to 50% of our seniors and may, may, many of the South Asian older adults in the larger community. Access to affordable health care is especially important for our seniors. Almost 80% of our low to no income seniors depend on Medicaid to get basic health care. The program has been a lifeline for them, providing coverage for hospital care, doctor's visits, and prescription drugs. With the proposed charges, changes uh, to public charge, including these programs, our seniors would certainly be impacted. I'd like to share the fear of our community members. The proposed public charge rule has already created fear in our community and made our seniors afraid to seek programs that would help support their basic needs. To proposed rule, the proposed rule would have further negative impact by leading to disenrollment from certain public benefits programs among our members and clients. Out of fear, it would affect not only themselves, but also their families. Recently, naturalized citizens are afraid to apply for public benefits in fear of it affecting their citizenship status. Based on our observations, the public charge rule may cause our members to forego enrollment in or disenrollment themselves from public benefits programs because they do not understand the rules, details, and would fear their enrollment could negatively affect their or their family members' immigration status. For example, one of the seniors we work with recently applied for citizenship and he is eligible for SSDI due to his physical condition. However, he is reluctant to apply for SSDI as he's afraid to might affect his citizenship ap application. Moving forward, we recommend the city council take the following steps. Clearly inform the South Asian community on public church through adequate language access service and legal help available in the South Asian languages and work with and provide special funding to grassroots organizations like ours to further disseminate knowledge on public church to South Asian seniors. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you to the New York City Council for providing us this opportunity. My name is Carrie Cecil. I'm the Director of Development and Communications at the Arab American Family Support Center. Um, for nearly 25 years, we've been working with um, the Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities throughout New York City to promote well-being, prevent violence, get families ready to succeed, and to communicate the needs of the marginalized populations. Um, we have witnessed um, our community members have increased fear. We've witnessed uh, community members choosing not to enroll in important benefits, not to enroll in SNAP, not to enroll in health insurance, and to drop out of other important programs that are not listed in public charge because of fear and misunderstanding of what this can cause. Um, what we haven't heard a lot of today is around the implications for mental health, which is something that I would like to point out. This community of Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian community members is already being unfairly targeted, um, particularly around the travel ban and other xenophobic policies. This just amplifies those um, feelings of stress and depression and anxiety that we are seeing in our community. Um, so this goes beyond implications around physical health and extends to mental health. Um, our recommendations are to continue to say no to the proposed changes, um, to commit to supporting immigrants and refugees with additional resources um, in instances when they do avoid those benefits, um, particularly for SNAP and food benefits. We are, as an organization, looking for other ways that we can connect people to food. Um, that is an immediate need. And then um, finally to consider uh, increasing access to linguistically competent, linguistically and culturally competent mental health services. We at the Arab American Family Support Center are providing these right now because we recognize that need, um, but we, we need the city council support there as well. Thank you. Hi. Um Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you how the pu proposed public charge rule impact the lives of our community members. My name is Inhe Grace Kim, and I'm an assistant director at Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York. Um, we are a community-based organization based in Queens, and we have six different sites, and we are serving daily 1,100 individuals through uh, six sites. Um, I would like to share a story because many 
people share wonderful strategies and everything. So I'd like to share a story. Um, uh, the uninsured female patient in her 60s is in the process of getting her green card, and we provide a free mammogram and free hepatitis B screening and the treatment. Um, so she used to get our services for her hepatitis B condition, yet she suddenly refused to take the medication, and we could not reach her anymore after she heard about public charge. So that's but despite lengthy explanation of how it will not affect her, and she chose not to get screened for her fear of getting her green card denied. Our community members now have to choose between health and immigration status. Sadly, they often choose immigration state status over health. Also, um, many ethnic media reports pub uh, publish misleading and incorrect information, and Korean American in New York has the highest uninsured rate among Asian Americans. But due to the fear generated by this proposed rule, I expect this rate to increase even higher. Um, it is crucial to provide our community member with an accurate information around the proposed public charge rule and educate them. The due to the highest limited English proficiency rate in our community compared to other immigrants' community, the culturally competent material should be provided. And moreover, working closely with the community-based organization would be the key to reducing fear among the New York, um, New York City most vulnerable population. And therefore, working with the community-based organization with the city council support will be crucial to reach hard to reach population and educate and assist our community members. So I think one more story. I just got a phone call from my colleague who's helping client right now as a navigator, health insurance. And she just called me and then she's asking me, oh, the two, two seniors come, came and then they ask, they don't want to get Medicaid. And if there is other choice, ask to me. And I'm a navigator as well. I've been working ever since 2013. And I said, what are, I asked them, what are their immigration status? And they're US, US citizen. And I asked her why they're hesitating to apply for Medicaid. And she said, um, because they're just afraid of the public charge. And this is kind of like example of the mis misinformed because as a US citizen, they don't need to worry about any um, Medicaid or any application, but they do and they are refusing. And the only option they have is just buying private health insurance. And I just got a phone call from them. And I constantly um, try to educate our community and try to have a workshop. And however, um, uh, communica their, the communication from the attorneys and the ethnic media is so powerful, it's really hard for us to educate them without uh, proper support from the city. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I guess. Uh, my name is Tasfia. Can you pull the mic closer to you? Sure. Uh, my name is Tasfia Rahman, and I'm the policy coordinator for the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid repeating uh, the information. Um, we, um, we lead 50 Asian-led and Asian-serving um, uh, community and social service organizations, and we've been flooded with um, anecdotal um, uh, stories about disenrollment. Um, particularly what I'd like to focus on is on health disparities. And in the US, we already have a major health disparity issue, uh, particularly among marginalized communities. Um, in New York City, um, for example, at CACF, we are seeing this in our efforts to ensure more access to affordable health care. We are a lead agency in New York State that receives in-person a sister IP or navigator grant for the New York State of Health, um, the official health insurance marketplace. It's currently open enrollment and our I IPAs, um, navigators provide one-on-one -on -one assistance to individuals, families, small businesses, and their empl employees who apply for health insurance to the marketplace. We provide, our, part our navigator partner organizations provide culturally and linguistically tailored outreach and education about the Affordable Care Act, as well as enrollment assistance for private and public health insurance. This year, during um, the current open enrollment period, our patient navigators have witnessed a significant decline in new enrollments since last year and in previous years. Um, I wouldn't be as optimistic to say that we solved our lack of um, inaccessibility to health insurance in a year, but what we're really getting a sense is that people are afraid that if they sign up 
For affordable health insurance, they may endanger their ability to remain in this country. Um, so with this in mind, we asked uh, New York City Council and other op public officials to act on two things. Um, we appreciate the efforts um, that you've taken to uh, um, uh, encourage uh, constituents to submit their public comment, um, but we also um, encourage you, all city council members to submit their own comment, and when they do, that they illustrate the impact this is having on all immigrant com communities, including the APA. Um, and also to educate their, our, our constituents and encourage community participation. Um, this rather vague and complicated nature of the proposed public charge rule is instilling a pervasive fear that is preventing individuals and families eligible. Um, council members should continue to support community organizations leveraging um, existing initiatives that have uh, served to uh, access, serve to educate um, out of out of reach marginalized communities um, and provide uh, CBOs with resources and outreach to their constituents about the correct information on the proposed rule. Um, so thank you so much for hearing our testimony and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for giving me opportunity to speak here today. My name is Hiroko Hatanaka. I'm a board of mem member of the board of the Japanese American Social Service Services, Inc. Um, I am speaking on behalf of uh, our director today because she's not available. Um, JASI is the only uh, social services agency serving the Japanese community in New York City, and we have served 37 years uh, providing uh, various social services. The Proposed policy will undermine access to essential health, nutrition, and, sh and shelter for the eligible immigrant and their family members. In fact, the client and community members we serve uh, have already withdrawn from benefit they are entitled to receive for fear of the receiving them will affect their immigration status or lead to a deportation. And one example that I would like to give is that um, one of our client who signed up essential health care recently came to us and said she would like to withdraw the, uh, the essential plan because her attorney said that will have an impact on her uh, immigration status. So uh, many of our clients are either on some kind of temporary visa or undocumented. They fear created by these rules will cause lasting harm to entire communities. So what we would like to recommend is that, from our point of view, you can help us by delivering a clear message to the community, as many languages as possible. Please note that there are so many immigrants who limit, whose English is limited, and messages translated into their own language will have a stronger impact, and they, will, they tend to trust that. You can help us by ensuring that assistance in this issue, and not only in New York major languages, but also other languages as well, as well for particularly for immigration hotlines. Thank you so much. Thank you for your, for your comments, and thank you for this entire panel as well. Again, be safe out there. It's a little treacherous. Our next and, I believe, final panel. So if I do not read your name and you want to testify, please come up to the Sergeant of Arms and fill out an appearance card. Uh, CFR, Danny Alicia, uh, Center for Family Representation. Mark Avellinotti, NMIC, Faith Bahum, the UJA Federation, Aswini uh, Periasani, FPWA, Anthony Feliciano, Commission on the Public Health. No. And is there anyone that has not been called that would like to testify? And Frank, how many people have, have submitted? We have seven. 
Can we get 10 more? Let's get to 17 comments before we leave today. Please don't hesitate to come out to the back. Thank you so much for those who have submitted comments as well. Okay, let's start. Would you like to start? Please introduce yourself. Good afternoon and thank you for your leadership. Uh, my name is Danny Alisea. I supervise the immigration practice at the Center for Family Representation, um, which was founded in 2002 to reduce reliance on foster care and improve outcomes for children and their families. Um, I will focus my comments today on our perspective as uh, providers of legal and social work services to parents um, who are facing child welfare proceedings. It has already been stated and stressed that the proposed rules are causing confusion and fear. I will also add that many government caseworkers are frequently confused or misinformed about the implications of immigration reform for individuals and families. Uh, Non-citizens' unwillingness to seek public benefits will inevitably increase contact between families and the child welfare system, will prolong involvement and reduce the likelihood of positive outcomes. They may lose the, the ability to provide their children with basic necessities, which will then trigger allegations of neglect. Uh, child welfare proceedings also require multiple court appearances, conferences, monitoring appointments, custodies, uh, conferences and ACS meetings, which will take, which will cost the government significant amount of funds. Uh, in order to ameliorate the problems which brought them to court, parents are required to demonstrate parental fitness. To accomplish this, parents are generally ordered to participate in services such as individual and family therapy, anger management, or drug treatment. Most of these services would typically be covered by insurance. Non-citizen parents can be forced to choose between defying an ACS or court order and, at least in their minds, risking their immigration status to obtain insurance or other benefits. Moreover, the added burden on ACS and family courts will put, this, will put strain on these institutions, leading to backups and a slower administration of justice. To the extent that a decrease in immigrant public benefit participation leads to the separation of families, it will also generate significant costs for the government. In 2010, for example, the average annual cost of placing a child in New York foster care was $56,060. Um, more than half of children who enter foster care remain there for longer than a year, and 22% remain for more than three years. Since 2007, we estimate that we have saved the city and taxpayers over $37 million uh, through our preventive legal and social work services. Um, finally, uh, increased engagement with the child welfare system inevitably will uh, cause harm to children. Um, research indicates that removal from families and placement in foster care can negatively impact a child's life outcomes. So an immigration policy that chills non-citizens' access to these life-saving public benefits draws families into the child welfare system. So the recommendation uh, that we have would, uh, that is unique would be to support and provide funding for um, service providers who are doing the individual and family therapy, drug treatment, um, in conjunction with the Administration for Children's Services so that people's access to the services is, uh, they can access it without respect for whether they have insurance or not. Thank you. Do you have, do we have a copy of your testimony? You do. Okay, good, thank you. Good evening, my name is Faith Bayham and I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. Established more than 100 years ago, UJA is one of the nation's largest local philanthropies. We support nearly 100 nonprofit organizations serving those that are most vulnerable and in need of programs and services. On behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the impact of the proposed public charge rule on New York City. If the proposal passes to update the public charge requirements, many low-income immigrants will choose between receiving benefits that allow them to access health care, food, and other necessities, and pursuing permanent residency in the United States. UJA is particularly concerned not only for the individuals who receive services through our agencies, 
but the people who are employed to provide those services. Some of our nonprofit partners provide services and supports to the elderly to live in the community. Many of the home health aides who are the backbone of supporting the elderly are immigrants receiving benefits such as SNAP and Medicaid. These individuals need these benefits to make ends meet. If the public, par public charge proposal is passed, these individuals will be forced to choose between receiving benefits or jeopardizing their immigrant statuses. In 2015, UJA, the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, and Catholic Charities of New York jointly selected a set of policies and contracted with the Urban Institute to test their effects on rates of poverty individually and combined. The study found that increasing SNAP benefits by 31% reduced poverty to 18.7%, increasing the number of housing vouchers in order to help half of the current waiting list reduce poverty to 19.9%. According to these findings, if the public charge rule is updated and individuals and families are deterred from enrolling in housing assistance or SNAP, the poverty rate in New York City will increase. UJA's fellow, fellow social service organizations, including Jewish federations nationwide, are concerned by the seeming attack on poor immigrants and the organizations that serve them. The charitable network would incur costs in responding to the increased need, even as it struggles to meet existing need. Across the country, food banks, pantries, religious congregations, and other emergency food providers are already frequently overwhelmed, unable to consistently serve all the people who require assistance. Uh, we definitely echo, as far as recommendations, the need for reliable information to be given to the communities who are going to be impacted by this rule. Um, UJA would just like to thank Speaker Johnson and City Council for their leadership on this critical issue. Thank you for your time. Buenas noches. My name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the executive director of the Commission on the Public Health System. Um, it's obviously clear to all of us that redefining public charge the way it is is a racist act. Um, so what do we do about it? Um, obviously is the public comment period, but I want to emphasize why it's so important. It's not just because all our voices, diverse voices are needed with that, but it's also to understand that we have to inundate the federal government with those voices. Um, it's clear if we, not all those voices would be heard or, or read if everything looks the same in terms of our messages. And so people need to understand that. When, and that's what the importance of inundating. And it's also to, to counter the narrative, the negative narrative that they've had on immigration um, before and after, uh, before Trump and now. Um, the other area is um, to revisit and revive past efforts like Action Health, to look at those past proposals and what could we do to, to think it through. And this was before this issue of public charge, but public charge heightens that awareness to look at those past efforts. I think it's also to look at supported city funded programs, um, similar to what Citizens Committee, our colleagues at Citizens Committee for Children stated. I think part of it is also to look at some of the existing programs like Access Health NYC, not to confuse it with Action Health. 33 community-based organizations and FQACs have the opportunity to increase their capacity around education and outreach, around access to health care issues. Their options, not only to coverage, but their rights. And so council members knowing who, where those groups are is to tap into them. We work closely with Immigration Coalition through that initiative. The other aspects to this for, for us is utilize, utilizing existing mechanisms for collaboration and information sharing and the dissemination. There are um, an obscure group now called the uh, Committee on City Healthcare Health Services. It was done through legislation through the City Council. Using those mechanisms, those um, committees, the, committee, the mental, health, mental Health Advisory Committee, all these efforts that the City Council and Department of Health have, and think about public charge as an, a focus or an effort in terms of the information. And I think we don't sometimes get the idea by why important education and training is. If we're gonna do this, all city agencies, how they inform before or after this, their strategy has to be through the community-based organizations and the community learning models that we have in New York City. It has to be addressed through those ways, not just them deciding, but thinking it through with the community-based organizations. It's also about not one-shot deals of training. It has to be consistent education. It has to be consistent training and revisiting those trainings when something happens at a, um, city worker level or anything where there's a disconnect with communication or something goes wrong. And I'll explain. Health and Hospitals has been doing a great job around the public charge. 
but we still see certain certified consular and navigators giving the wrong information. And we need to address that with not just a one-shot training, but a consistent training there. The final thing is the state. I don't see a visible urgency from the state, from the governor, around this issue. And I serve on the CMS Advocates um, Committee. I serve on the prevention agenda. And I constantly push this, uh, this effort and these issues. And it seems like, oh, we're doing this um, internally. Internally, without discussion with the city, without discussing with community based on that, means nothing. And we're not going to sustain all the reforms around the conditions now that keep people sick, the reforms that are happening around the delivery and the reimbursement of health care. It won't sustain, it won't be successful if our fellow New Yorkers, a large segment, are iced out, are completely, won't have access to health care. And those are critical areas to look at. Good evening. On behalf of Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, or NIMIC, I thank you for the opportunity to present our views on changes to public charge proposed by DHS. My name is Mark Falinati, and I'm the managing immigration attorney at NIMIC. NIMIC is a community-based nonprofit organization founded in 1979 that has grown into a leading multi-service agency, the staff of over 100 serving New York City, with a focus on Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. NIMIC's immigration unit provides immigration screenings and a wide range of services to the New York City community. The proposed changes to public charge contain heightened income-based standards that will prevent our community members from securing lawful permanent resident status. Aside from penalizing applicants who have or are likely to receive an expansive list of benefits, the changes impose onerous income requirements on new immigrants and their families. Under the new guidelines, an applicant's current lack of employment or health insurance will be considered heavily weighted negative factors against their application. The positive factors that would be taken into account include the new immigrant's ownership of financial assets or require the new immigrant's household in the U.S. to earn at least 250 percent above federal poverty guidelines. In our community, many new permanent residents are petitioned for by low-income family members who work hard and save what they can to bring their relatives to this country. Many new immigrants come to the U.S. in the hope of finding educational and employment opportunities that, they are unable, that are unattainable in their home countries. They study at our colleges and often begin work at low-wage occupations in order to advance in society and work towards a brighter future. Many new immigrants are the parents of U.S. citizens seeking to reunite and spend the rest of their lives supporting their children and grandchildren. For an example, one of our elderly clients from Ecuador was petitioned for by her naturalized U.S. citizen daughter. With representation from NIMIC, she was able to successfully adjust to permanent resident status and now lives with her daughter and helps care for her grandchildren. The daughter works full-time but earns relatively low income, and the mother was a housewife in Ecuador with no financial assets of her own. Under the new guidelines, she would not be able to reunite with her daughter and grandchildren. The extraordinary financial burdens of the changes to public charge send the clear message that the U.S., that DHS only wishes to admit those who have already found wealth or success to the exclusion of those seeking the opportunity that the American dream promises. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before we end the panel, I'm going to hand it over to our, ch our co-chairs for final comments. Uh, Chair Levine? Or any questions that you might have, too. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Chaka, and thank you to this panel and all of the experts and activists and community members who spoke today. I've been keeping a rough tally. And so far, by my approximate estimation, 100% of the people who spoke today are negative about these proposed changes. And it represents an important document of um, the smartest minds in the city uh, making it clear just the scale of harm that awaits New Yorkers if these rule chains, rules changes are made uh, enacted. Uh, we need to stop at nothing to push back on this. I view this as no less uh, morally bankrupt than separating kids from their families at the border. And in that case, it was public pressure that forced the Trump administration to reverse course. We didn't actually win that fight legislatively because we didn't control Congress. And we have described the difficult path to overturn this legislatively. But public opinion has and can again 
force even Donald Trump to overturn um, anti-immigrant policies. And we need to make sure that there's an, up, an uproar of comparable scale for this proposed change. And I am more and more confident with the, the input and the activism of, of this panel and everyone else who spoke that we will indeed push back. We will win this fight and protect uh, the precious immigrants of New York City and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your incredible leadership on this issue and every issue affecting immigrants in the city. Really a um, pleasure to be working with you in this fight. Thank you, Chair Levine. And oh, sorry, I and I didn't see that Chair Levin is here as well. And you, have, you as well have been uh, absolutely incredible. And having your brain power focus on this is really invaluable. Invalu Great to be working with both of you. Thank you, Chair Levine. And we are a team here, a trifecta uh, of committees and the staff uh, behind us. Uh, Chair Levin. Thank you very much, Chairman Chaka. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you, uh, as Chair Levine said, for your uh, really stellar leader leadership here and uh, organizing today's hearing and keeping this council focused on this um, uh, from uh, the moment uh, that we heard that this uh, rule was promulgated and, and, uh, and even before. Um, and, uh, and having um, a, a real clarity of purpose and moral leadership is, is, uh, is vital, and we appreciate that very much. And uh, to Chair Levine, uh, thank you. I think it's, it's uh, essential that um, we have uh, um, the full weight of the health committee under your leadership, um, looking out for the health of New Yorkers um, and the health of, of our immigrant brothers and sisters uh, uh, not just here, but uh, around the country. And um, uh, this council is uh, taking a great leadership role uh, with you at the helm of the health committee. So thank you for that. Um, to all of uh, everybody that came to testify and to the administration, um, I think it's so important that we keep up the pressure on this, that we keep up the pressure on our governor to do as much as he can, uh, to keep up, uh, to make sure um, that uh, when she is sworn in in January, that Letitia James is our Attorney General is doing everything that she can, uh, a great colleague of ours uh, for many years, um, uh, that, uh, that our congressional delegation is going to the mat on this uh, when they are uh, going in uh, under Speaker Pelosi's leadership in January, um, that it's front and center, uh, that this issue uh, not get um, uh, you know, not play uh, uh, second act to any other issue. Uh, this is so, um, this is a disgusting, disgusting and sick policy. It is sick. Uh, it is, it represents um, a morally craven and morally bankrupt worldview that is residing in the White House with Stephen Miller and Donald Trump and um, we, everybody of good conscience and everybody of, of, uh, of, 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 of good faith um, in this country ought to be outraged. And if they knew what this was, I believe most people would be outraged. I just looked up what pub public uh, polling shows for um, pre -existing, protecting pre-existing conditions under the, uh, under the uh, ACA. 75% of Americans think it's important to protect pre-existing condition. I bet you if you asked Americans, should people be denied a green card because of a pre-existing condition or because of an education status or, a, um, or an economic status, I bet you you'd see similar numbers. I doubt anybody's done that polling because this issue hasn't been risen to that level. And so I think that our job, um, and we had a, a thorough hearing today, and it was a technical hearing, and we learned about this and how it would affect New Yorkers, and we heard from all of our advocate, advocate and provider communities about what it means for their day-to-day -day, uh, operations and for their clients' day-to-day -day lives, um, and we saw that very clearly, and I think that this had a real impact. It also had the impact, I think, of raising the issue just another notch, because that needs to continue to happen. We need to get this front and center. This needs to be talked about. At, on cable news, this needs to be uh, talked about um, on uh, you know on on our on, on whatever it is, whatever uh, 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 form of, of uh, public communication. We need to put that out there front and center. But we need our partners. We need our partners in the federal government. We need our governor. We need our s other states in in, um, uh, in partnership with us. 
And so that's all of our collective responsibility to make sure that it's front and center. So I want to thank you for your, your time. You stayed here for five hours to wait to testify. We so greatly appreciate that because um, that just shows how important this is and, and, and how important the role that you, you play in this all is, is as well and the work that you do. So I want to thank you for your, your testimony. Chair, thanks again for your leadership and to the, the entire uh, council staff that has worked so hard to put this hearing together. Thank you as well. I'll turn it back over. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chair Levin and uh, our Sergeant of, St uh, Sergeant of Arms as well. Thank you so much for, for your dedication to this uh, hearing and the whole day of hearings. This has been a series of hearings that we've had here today. And my last real comments as I thank you again for being here in the last uh, are, are the following. I think the technical nature of this, of this hearing presents the, the, the larger problem that we have ahead of us and how to, how to fix this issue. And what I keep struggling with here is this idea that that the the, the origin of this public charge uh, is is an interesting one that is nothing compared to the proposal that we have in front of us, and this idea that we're that we're protecting the United States by folks who are going to be a burden by impacting the people who are already here and forcing them through this incredibly brilliant, I think, in some ways. Uh, but dark and evil and wrong and disgusting uh, that's really fueled by uh, a white supremacist motive, a xenophobic motive, a, a motive that doesn't save any money at all, doesn't protect us, it actually does the opposite. It's forcing us to think about funding in ways that we've never had to deal with in the past. It's forcing us as a city to make decisions that we shouldn't be making. In fact, um, I think what's really interesting is that it's forcing us to think about what our role is as a city and as a state. And, and right now, as the winds of change are <laughs> a tumultuous in the federal government, I don't know when that's going to calm down. And I don't know that where this hope is coming from, from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I don't think it's going to calm down at all. And so we need to make some hard decisions at the city and the state level. And you've all really presented some really good tr uh, of pathways to start figuring it out. And that's about training, that's about getting more food out to people, uh, using our infrastructure of nonprofits and IDNYC. We have a lot of different infrastructure to get stuff out uh, and make sure that our legal teams are out there ready to, to, to have conversations. We can't do it alone, we need to do it with the city and the state together and move from a reactionary, move from reactionary uh, to proactive measures. And I'm really thankful that you're here today and we've taken everything that you have given us, given to us uh, serious and we're gonna analyze it and come back to you actually after the December 10th deadline. And I wanna just ask Frank, how many, how many did we get? Seven total? So we haven't moved up. So there are people in this room right now that if you haven't yet made that comment, to please make that comment. And for anyone that's out there listening ouramericanstory.us is the webpage that we're sending everyone to. Uh, and make your comment. It's in English. Uh, it has, it's, forced, uh, it's forcing us to use the English language, uh, but to make that comment and get to 100,000 plus comments. Thank you. What was that? By December 10th. Midnight, December 10th. Make your comment before December 10th, midnight. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll call this hearing, we'll adjourn this hearing now. Thank you.